We do. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you all for our first public meeting of the new school board. Um, we are going to begin with certification of uh, closed meeting. So um, in order to comply with section 2.23712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on January 9, 2024, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Uh, motion from Mr. Frisch. Is there a second? A uh, second from Mr. Moon. Uh, all those in favor? Ms. Uh, uh, Okay, um, we have Mr. Moon, Ms. Anderson, Mr. Frisch, Mr. McElveen, uh, Ms. Lady, uh, Ms. Dixit, Ms. St. John Cunning, Mr. McDaniel. All those opposed? Uh, Ms. Anderson, Dr. Anderson and um, Ms. Merritt. Okay, um, now next. Um, you want to do that one? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser has submitted a written request to attend this meeting virtually due to a personal conflict. All those in favor of approving Ms. Sizemore Heiser's request, please raise your hands. Uh, Ms. Marin, Mr. Moon, Ms. Anderson, Mr. Frisch, Mr. McElveen, Mr. McDaniel, Ms. St. John Cunning, Ms. Dixit, Dr. Anderson, and myself, Ms. Lady. Okay, with that business taken care of, we can dive into what hopefully will not take four hours, but we have al allocated four hours for, or is that, five, is that four hours or five hours? Can I not? Okay, five hours. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, I would like uh, to first lay out a few ground rules. So as discussed earlier, um, if you would like to make a comment, have a question, please uh, turn your placard up, and that way um, Miss Lady and I will be able to uh, keep track of everyone who wants to contribute to the conversation. Um, the run of show for today is uh, we are going to have a presentation on uh, the capital improvement program um, by our, our staff members. Uh, and I think since this is the first time we're meeting uh, a number of them, if they could just briefly introduce themselves as well. Uh, and then after their presentation, we will dive into uh, what looks like four and a half hours of questions. But. Um, Hopefully that will not be the case. Um, as was mentioned previously, each board member will have three minutes uh, for their initial intervention, and uh, we will have uh, we will proceed to go backs after that. Um, so, with that, I would like to hand it over to our colleagues, and please again introduce yourselves. So, thank you, Mr. McElveen. Um, this afternoon, as we uh, work on the. Uh, topic of the capital improvement plan. I want to introduce our chief of staff, Marty Smith, to introduce the team that will be presenting to you this afternoon. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marty Smith. I'm the chief of staff for Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, we have our former chief operating officer sitting next to me, uh, Mr. Chuck Fanshaw. Uh, he is here in support today. And we have our uh, chief of facilities and planning, uh, Ms. Janice Szymanski, who is here as well. All right, good afternoon. As Marty mentioned, my name is Janice Szymanski. I'm the new Chief of Facility Services and Capital Programs here at FCPS. And today we are gonna cover a summary of the presentation on the proposed Capital Improvement Program for fiscal year 25 through 29. So just to start and give you an overview, a Capital Improvement Program or CIP is a planning and fiscal management tool used to coordinate the location, timing, and funding of projects over five years. The cash flow is submitted to the county for incorporation into the larger Fairfax County CIP. The FCPS CIP includes an annual overview of student membership and facilities data to identify new capital projects. Newly identified needs are included in the estimated schedule of capital projects for the next five years, and the capital cash flow tracks the funding allocation for these projects. 
As part of that, we look at updated membership. So updated membership information for the division and the school is included in the CIP. This is based on the September certified membership data. For this school year, 23-24, total membership as of September was 180,806 students. We continue to monitor the impacts of the membership from the pandemic, and it remains still under the school year 1920 by 8,204 students. Three main factors that contribute to changes in membership include the birth to kindergarten ratio, the migration of students, and the transfer of students. Uh, data for these three factors have been included in the slides at the end of this presentation for reference. And uh, please note that the impacts of COVID-19 continue to be uncertain. Uh, membership still does remain, as I mentioned, under that 1920 school year um, by that amount. In addition to our just annual membership, we also look at projections. So the five-year projection set is also included in the CIP and reflects um, a relatively flat within the five-year projection period. Uh, this is mostly due to part uh, of the overall decline in membership since the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, lower, including lower birth rates and a decline of elementary and middle school cohorts over time. The largest cohorts of classes in FCPS are currently in the 10th and 11th grades. The Fairfax County Demographic Report uh, confirms this trend with a decline in the school age population between 2020 and 2025. So with some of that decline and ongoing changes in membership, it's really important to highlight that projections are updated annually in the CIP to reflect these conditions, especially as we move out further from the pandemic. This slide is just to give you a little bit of an overview on our funding sources, especially as it pertains to facilities. So uh, funding sources for the CIP include our, mainly our general obligation bond as voted on by residents in the biannual school board referendum. The annual limit for general obligation bond funding has increased over time, and the most increased, recent increase is a result of the joint CIP committee in 2021. This increased the annual allocation to $205 million a year and another increase up to 230 and is going to be implemented in FY25 and beyond. So we thank Fairfax County and the Board of Supervisors for their continued partnership, which has resulted in an increase in funding for the CIP. Um, as a result of escalation in the construction industry and many other factors, uh, we at FCPS, we continue to monitor these costs as they relate to capital projects, and you'll see that reflected in the cash flow. And then I also have here to note additional funds that impact the CIP, and that includes our general operating fund and some funds um, from the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors for infrastructure management, the capital sinking fund, and proffers, and the state construction grant. This sort of gives you, this graphic gives you more of an overview of the CIP within context of greater planning. Um, we review and collaborate with county planning staff uh, with residential developments going on in the county beyond just five years. So to identify impacts on school facilities, staff monitors new residential developments during either a plan amendment review process for Fairfax County comp plan or the review process for rezoning application. And then obviously as part of that five-year membership projection um, that we include in each CIP. So this slide really just talks to the type of projects that you will see in our FCPS CIP. They're kind of broken down into four main categories. Um, they include new school construction, so adding a new school to the portfolio, capacity enhancements, so the addition of modulars or adding a permanent wing or addition to a property, uh, facility renovations, that is the bulk of what you will see in the CIP. So that's working off of our renovation queue adopted in 2009. And then any potential sites. So if we've identified areas where a new school will be needed and we would need to purchase land as a result of that. So to give you some context, here's a, a couple examples of recently completed capital projects. So we have up on the screen uh, Braddock Elementary, Fox Mill, Hybla Valley, 
Uh, these were recently com uh, completed within the last year or two in Frost Middle School. So our cash flow identifies funding for capital projects within the next five to 10 years as outlined below. To give you an overview, for five years, for new construction, we have done Loring Elementary School. For capacity enhancements, we have Justice and three modular relocations. And then again, as I mentioned, the bulk of our CIP is going through the renovation cycle. So in the five-year cash flow, we have 18 elementaries, two middle schools, and two high schools. Looking beyond the five-year out to 10 years, we also have for new construction and repurposing Silver Line Elementary School, Western High School, uh, the Route 1 Early Childhood Center, Tyson's Elementary, Pimmett Hills uh, repurposing, Virginia Hills repurposing, for renovations, we have a couple more elementary schools and then any future renovations that would be part of the new queue. And then for site acquisitions, we have in our 10 year, the Western High School site acquisition. So this is a summary of the funding for these projects. The total five year funding requirement is approximately 1.2 billion. And as of today, we have 533 million funded by bonds. That means we have about 710 million that's unfunded and would be included in future bond referenda. Uh, we do anticipate in our cash flow, we worked it out so that assuming the cash, uh, the bond referendum do pass over the course of five years, this unfunded portion would be funded. And then you can also see uh, in the 10 year uh, total requirement, we're looking at about currently 578 million with a total unfunded portion of 1.9 billion. So impacts to our cash flow and our schedule of capital projects, I do want to point out that just beyond Fairfax, but more globally speaking, um, construction costs have been on the rise. Uh, we are no um, exemption to that. We're seeing definite increase in cost of construction, inflation. Um, here in Fairfax, we're now having to incorporate prevailing wage. Um, and there's also a specific more to this local region, labor shortage issues that are impacting our price. So we will say that um, construction bids reflecting the state of the market have been averaging, honestly, about 33% over our cost estimates. So in the past, projects were either uh, value engineered to reduce costs and still needed to access uh, the construction reserve, which was established by past project savings. The increase to the county's bond allocation, allocation to schools going towards these increased costs is not quite sufficient to overcome these increases, so we want everyone to be aware of that. And so additional cost increases are um, going to mean to be considered when we're developing our cash flow. This is a, just a general timeline for an average project um, that are listed in our CIP, so you can kind of see where we would fall through the span of a project. Um, architectural services are procured through an RFP, and um, project assignments are provided to the board during that process. Mm -hmm. The design of bond approved projects kick off in the spring following the vote, and this phase lasts approximately a year or two depending on the size of the project. Uh, we also allow for time for permitting here at Fairfax County, and then once that has come, uh, finished, then the construction phase is started with school board <coughs> approval of a contractor selected. Um, there are multiple school and community meetings throughout this process, and in fact, we had been working with CPDC on that engagement process in the past couple years. So this slide really just shows the process for development of our renovation queue. Our current renovation queue will have funding for planning and design, and that's going to take us through the whole CIP. So what projects you see in the cash flow are the current renovation cycle that we're working through, and we anticipate that to take us through 3031. After which, we are going to develop a new renovation queue, and so we completed phase one with a consultant being on board, and they've begun to outline um, potential criteria 
They've engaged stakeholders uh, beginning with the school board in early 2023. And then phase two will assess facilities using the criteria set, compile that data, and create a tool to generate a new queue. And then phase three would to be to implement that. So just wanted to give the new board an update on where we are in that process. But I do just want to be transparent and say for the CIP that you're seeing today, we're still working through our old queue, our current queue of projects. Another big um, topic of discussion for our CIP is um, our commitment to sustainability and our um, JET goals. So the 2020 JET goal recommendations called for new county buildings and major renovations uh, to achieve net zero energy practices. So these types of enhancements will typically include uh, PV or solar arrays, uh, possibly ground source heat pumps from geothermal wells, and so active design and construction projects maximize some of these practices where possible and builds uh, not to preclude future installations as well. So, you know, one of the examples I can give is for new roofs on active construction and design projects in the CIP, we're providing extra structural support to support uh, future PV arrays. Um, so future projects starting in FY26 and beyond, we really want to up up those measures, and so we're looking at energy reduction measures to really try to aim for that on-site net zero. So part of that includes funding for upgrading to the geothermal systems, uh, upgrading your energy efficient envelope, going above and beyond what's required per code, and making sure that we have enough structural support for PVs, be it on new roofs for new additions, or existing roofs where we're renovating, and possibly where applicable uh, even canopies to make sure that we meet our on-site production needs. And beyond the energy reduction, which is a huge part of the CIP because it's a lot about building infrastructure, uh, here at FCPS we are looking beyond that. Uh, you know, we have our Get to Green program that I do want to highlight we currently have. 149 schools registered and uh, 54 award winners. We have our energy conservation uh, program and we're a seven time Energy Star Partner of the Year. We are currently working with vendors and under contract on two for a solar power purchase agreement. Uh, we're at, that would be at Annandale High School and Mason Crest Elementary School. And then again, the net zero piece that I spoke to before, starting with that planning and budgeting in the CIP for more net zero enhancements and building practices. Here in FCPS, you might be familiar with LEED. We use a similar credentialing uh, program called CHIPS, or Collaboration for High Performance Schools. It's a little bit more catered to schools, and so new school renovations are being recognized for CHIPS design. And then moving on beyond outside the facility, we are looking at electrification across the board, including electric vehicles. So we currently have 28 school buses in operation and three more on order. I do want to switch gears a little bit and start to talk beyond just big renovation bond projects and give you an overview of our infrastructure here at FCPS. So, with the current cycle of renovations coming out to approximately 42 years after the recent um, cash flow exercise, that is a lot longer than our 20 to 25 year renovation cycle identified at the onset of the, of the queue. So we do wanna point out that we are tracking um, some assets throughout our building. Our goal is to expand on that. But as you can see, just looking at it broken down by category, we have over a billion dollars uh, worth of uh, infrastructure pieces. These are not, this is the total value, and I'll, I'll clarify on the next slide, but this, was, this is what it would cost to replace all the known assets to date in our facilities. And you can see they're broken down by category. We then sort of took a look at the actual assets that are currently past their useful life. And again, this is a living, um, living tabulation. At the moment, we're looking at approximately $379 million of those assets I shared on the screen that are currently past their useful life. 
Uh, we took the, in this table, we kind of broke it down into four major categories, HVAC, athletic, asphalt, and other major maintenance. Um, so you can see what that breakdown looks like. And by comparison, our FY24 infrastructure replacement budget is approximately $30 million. So we recognize the need to really increase this program to be intentional about replacing assets that are past their useful life, especially given the fact that our renovation cycle is getting longer than it originally set out to be. So as we wrap up, I just want to show the timeline of the proposed CIP. Today is the work session, January 9th. The new business is scheduled for Thursday. It's coming Thursday on January 11th. The public hearing is scheduled for Thursday, January 18th. And the school board is scheduled to take action on the proposed CIP on February 8th. Once adopted, uh, we will work with the county government staff and will incorporate our information into their CIP for release mid-February. And that concludes my summary presentation of the CIP. Thank you very much. Well, that was a whirlwind tour. Thank you so much. That was, um, uh, you did that very expeditiously. Thank you. Um, so now uh, we turn to questions, and I apologize for the cold temperature. I just tried to adjust it. We'll, we'll get things back to normal, hopefully. Um, so please, uh, if anyone has any comments, again, we're going to begin with opening interventions, uh, three minutes each. I see Dr. Anderson is, and, uh, and Mr. Frisch are first. Okay. Before you start my time, I just had a couple of questions regarding the additional documents. Were you going to review the membership trends? Yep, those. We are happy to. We provided them as an appendix to okay. this presentation, so I will I'll defer to okay. the board. It's fine. I, it's just here. I thought you were going to review it. It's fine. I'm just going to dive into my questions. Um, I remember on March 1, Mr. Frisch and I, and actually Dr. Reed, we engaged with DLR on that workshop to help set the criteria for um, the renovation queue. And I think I was surprised that we did not get the report until December when the date on the report, Dr. Reed, is May. Can you speak a little bit about that delay to get that information to us? Yeah, May 15th. I'm happy to. I know there was a lot of back and forth with DLR after their draft, and I would have to um, defer to Mr. Fanshaw on the readiness to have it be more broadly shared or its tentative completion. So one of the things that we did, we paused that whole process was to let the strategic plan process play out completely. So th that's why once we had the uh, sessions, um, <clears throat> and one of the one of the uh, request from the uh, contractor was to suggestion was that we make sure that we're lining with the new strategic okay. plan. So we backed away from really doing anything. They would prepared their notes uh, based on that. Um, and through, you know, my uh, remaining time as uh, in my former position, really didn't address, move forward with that because we were launching really the strategic plan. So th this was a step one as we looked at it. Uh, it was not, uh, in my opinion, a launching point for um, moving forward with a, without more engagement and more input. And I think that's where maybe I was confused because I recall that that initial conversation was to set the criteria, not that it would be the preliminary discussion to the phase two. I thought that was the job of DLR. I, I've been trying to get my hands on the scope of that contract, but have not yet been successful. But I got confused there that we would now have to go out to bid to continue the step two. Can you speak to that a little bit, Mr. Fanshawe? Well, I think one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did was to assess the condition of our facilities as a critical piece in any decision making going forward. So parallel with the the thought exercise, 
the DLR was going through, we were working to, to develop a contract to do uh, the condition assessment for existing facilities, okay. which is should be a large component of any uh, future queue. I was also operating under the impression that we needed to move faster to get a new queue in place, um, and that wasn't really the realities of the market have kind of shown that we've got a lot, we have more years under the existing queue based on uh, projects that are, are playing out now. So the, the urgency of moving into queue development, okay. I think was lessened based on that. No, thank you. So the conditions assessment that you're speaking of, what do we anticipate that to be the timeline? Right now, staff are drafting a scope of work to make sure that we can get the right team on board to do a broad uh, assessment of our facilities. And I believe that Fairfax City has recently conducted a similar exercise. So we've talked with them and gotten a copy of their RFP as a starting point for writing our own scope of work. Thank you. Can you also tell me what was the contract for DLR for this part of the work? Contract amount? I, I don't recall what it. I don't. Re, I don't recall what that number was. Would that be able to? Can somebody share that at some point? I'm sure we can find. Yes, we'll, we can find that out. Okay, thank you. Um, just kind of move on. Moving on to the presentation a little bit. Um, one of the things that I think I was surprised by, and I shared with you, Janice, um, Ms. Semensky, is that we didn't have the typical two by twos um, with board members for us to really dig in. I know when I was a brand new board member, this was a very helpful way of really becoming acclimated to the um, to the CIP and we had a similar timetable so I did want to express that that did not happen and I don't think the board had any knowledge because at one point I had a meeting set up and then it wasn't <clears throat> I can speak to that dr. Anderson I think the transition um, of new boards and the timing of the holiday and the timing of the uh, building of the plan uh, precluded the opportunity to do two by twos. I think we uh, had hoped with the um, work session today that questions would be able to be answered um, today, hopefully. Well, I'm going to take the moment to raise the things I would have raised in my, C in my two by two, um, which is one, overall HVAC issues, with I, which I think you alluded to in that document for $379 million that I have a, uh, some questions about, which will probably come up in my go back. But I do want to raise um, three schools in the Mason District, Wayanoke um, Elementary, Belvedere Elementary, and Luther Jackson Middle that I share both with Mr. Um, I share with Mr. Frisch in the Providence District. Um, those are the schools that I would like for evaluations by staff to be added to the queue wherever and whenever that looks, however that looks. Um, I think I can go down the stats that you all have regarding the number of trailers, um, the dates of renovations. These buildings are, um, are highly problematic. And one of the things that stood out to me in the DLL, DLR report was that it said, when facilities are in poor condition, they significantly decrease student and teacher engagement. They increase absenteeism and suspensions. I find that to be interesting, particularly in the case of Wayne Oak Elementary, which in September had eight staff vacancies, and as of today has seven staff vacancies. They're interviewing, once people come into the building, they kind of accept other jobs. Um, so I, I'm really very curious about that correlation. So I want to make sure that I ask you, um, Ms. Zeminski, what should I look for the next step now that I'm raising these three schools to you as concerns? And then I'll put myself on the go back list. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was conferring with Mr. Oh, okay. Fanshaw, but uh, yeah, we can take note of those. So just so I understand the request, is it to add Wayne Oak, Luther Jackson, and Belvedere to the renovation queue? Yes. I, I, the reason why I'm particularly sensitive on this, it's because last year when we were here, I feel like I missed the boat on Glasgow, which I'm glad that I see in the draft. I don't want to miss the opportunity on, um, regarding these three schools, so I'd like to have clarity in terms of what is the process for me to elevate these three schools for the queue. Okay. 
I think we can take those notes and then with consensus take a look at uh, any updates that we would need to make to the CIP. Does that make sense? I need more than that. Are we looking for consensus in this conversation? Are we looking at consensus at the adoption of the CIP? I, I hate to throw this out at folks who just got here, but I, I just want to have clarity of process. I think the, the process has been a bit muddled over time uh, because there are some schools included in the queue that perhaps when you look at objective criteria might not otherwise be included in the queue. And then there are other schools, as we've discussed, that when you look at a set of objective criteria might should be in the queue that aren't, right? So I think we need to take a holistic view of 198 facilities, 198 schools, agree on what those business principles are for the, the pieces of um, those major operational topics as well as the condition of the building, number of trailers, et cetera, and create a queue that stands the test of time that's able to be objective. So I think hearing your concerns will be part of that process. Um, I think we're also creating queues around athletic topics and queues around safety and security topics so that uh, any time we find ourselves able to avail ourselves of a grant or perhaps mid-year or end-of-year one-time only dollars that would enable us to um, plug some of the you know holes that we currently see we'll have a list already in front of us so we don't need to kind of rediscover uh, the needs every cycle so I think there's a little hedging around a direct answer to what oh, the yes, process yes. is I want to name that um, I don't think it's intentional we don't intend to be Weasley um, as staff um, but I do think that we're building the process while we take the input and so I, I want to manage expectations the okay. because I, I do want to walk out of this conversation, out of this meeting with a response because my community is looking for me to move these forward and we're in this weird state and so I need guidance. Yeah, I'll just echo what Dr. Reed said and I think for staff's recommendation, we recommend continuing on through our current queue to touch those schools that haven't been on the renovation cycle yet. And then once we're concluded with that, we are at an interesting crossroads where we're developing the new criteria, and I think you bring up great points that should be considered when we're developing the new queue so that those issues will rise to the top and we can address them in our next cycle. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Can I ask you a question really quick? <laughs> yes. Uh, are you talking about adding them to the current queue or prioritizing them for the next queue? You, you feel free to respond. I don't know. I just want them in the queue. Whatever the queue is, Understood. whether it's the current or the new one, I don't want for these schools to miss the opportunity for inclusion. Gotcha. Okay. Um, speaking to that, I agree with um, the motivation behind prioritizing different schools for the queue. I wouldn't be supportive of adding anything to the current queue. Uh, and I do believe, along the lines of what the superintendent, Ms. Szymanski, were saying that um, the holistic approach needs to be, here are the criteria for the next queue. Um, and I think by any objective measure, uh, some of the issues that Dr. Anderson identified would be among those things. Uh, so I look forward to that conversation. Um, at the last CIP work session, I raised a red flag about the overruns that we were experiencing and how we might have to grapple with that. And according to this CIP draft, we are at that point of needing to grapple with that. Um, by way of example, um, you know, over the last few years, the county has given us even more money for uh, our bonds, not enough, but even more than we had previously been getting. Um, and yet, because of the costs associated with COVID, call it the COVID bubble, um, which is never going to burst, um, our projects are far more expensive than anticipated. And it's not for lack of planning. So Dr. Anderson and I were involved with the Falls Church renovation, which was bonded just before the pandemic. And so when it went to contract, it was contracted before the cost overruns started. And so many, several schools are in that position. And now we're left with the, the decision about how we're going to do that how we're gonna handle that. It's joined at the hip with the discussion around uh, the Joint Environmental Task Force's work, which I would like us all to stop calling recommendations. They were recommendations to our board that we then made directives to the superintendent. 
Um, so they are directives of this board that we will accomplish those goals. Uh, among them are moving towards uh, carbon neutrality as a system, which relies on us moving towards net zero buildings wherever humanly possible. And so I appreciate the approach laid out in this CIP um, for grappling with this heavy issue. Um, it does two things. One, it attempts to move us in the direction of accomplishing the JET goals without too much of a disruption to um, the queue of projects. Um, and I think that's important. Um, we have committed significant resources over the last few years to the JET work, um, and the community is counting on us to continue um, that trajectory. Um, our students certainly are as well. Um, so I appreciate that thoughtful approach. Um, and uh, one question I have before I, I save my other comments for the go back, uh, CPDC recently completed a, um, uh, a new focused approach to communicating our renovation projects. I'm curious um, how you see that informing um, whatever, we, whatever the board ends up approving with the CIP as it relates to these new projects, or not these new projects, but the adjusted projects that we might vote on. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point. Uh, we did work with the CPDC committee on developing a new plan for engagement to create more uniformity and more predictability to our communications plan, which is overseen by our communications team. So I think to your point, it's a good time to start using that document as a guidance so we can approach all the schools in the renovation queue the same way in terms of you know, informing the public when their project's slated to start. I do think you know, this is the time where we really reconcile the cash flow, make it as stable as possible so we can get ahead of those communications per that document. Okay, great. Um, next we have Ms. Marin. Thank you. I will start with um, the biggest thing that I think of when I think of the CIP, and that's our academic programs. And there's a section of content on page 14 of the CIP that says, unique program offerings should be made available in all division pyramids in order to keep students within their zone pyramid throughout their K-12 experience where conditions are conducive to program needs. I will say, Dr. Reed, the main thing I've heard from parents the last few weeks has been, why does my student not why is my student not able to get transportation from one pyramid to another if they want to take the academic program that's only offered in the other pyramid? So right now, that's our North Reston Elementary Schools that are in the Herndon Pyramid, and their children want to go to the IB program at South Lakes, which they've already been going to at Links and Hughes Middle School and been being provided transportation. So um, we really need to think of our buildings as how they're going to provide the program so that each student could stay at their neighborhood school and not have to be uh, trans transferred all over the county. I also think the maps starting in the resources page on page 259 are really helpful. They make the, the data make the invisible visible, as I know I've heard some of our school leaders say. I also want to touch on the renovations and the backlog. So given the, on page 16 and 17 of the, um, of the CIP draft, given the backlog of renovations, and the ones you mentioned today, Ms. Samansky, given the backlog of renovations for elements that are past the useful life, what are your thoughts on working through the process of using CIP funds, either already bonded or to be bonded, to pay for these costs so that more students, staff, and communities receive that benefit sooner, rather than just some school communities receiving something once every almost half a century? Yeah, I think it's a, uh... It's a challenging topic we have to grapple and plan out as much as possible ahead of time because the more you divert the bond referendum funding from the renovation queue, the longer you're going to make that queue, right? So if we're sitting at about 42 years, diverting those same funds to infrastructure would only then prolong the time it would take to get to the renovation again. So I think we need to take a definite broader approach beyond just the CIP bond funding to come up with a way to expand this program. I think, do think you bring up very good points. Well, thank you. And, you know, 
children only get that opportunity to be in school once. And if their school doesn't happen to be renovated for three or four decades, then they miss out. So do our, I think this is the conversation for a board and a great segue into a concern that I've raised to you all about the policies that guide our CIP review. And I have shared a memo that shows that the majority of the policies, most of which are identified in the CIP, that staff use to craft the CIP are overdue for a review, especially in light of the fact of a post-COVID, accelerated climate change uh, kind of world, um, not to mention our strategic plan and getting back to the academics. So I do think that, that is really critical for us to address. And part of that is, what is the renovation queue? Our current policy sets it at 25 years. So this is for the board's decision with staff guidance. To my colleagues, I just want to ask uh, or say, I do think we need more time to discuss this. There's just so much. I think Dr. Zvansky and her team have done a really great job you know, being new when we had Mr. Fanshaw here and we're a new board. So I would like more time. I'd love to call the board's attention to page 19 of the CIP that has those October 21st JET recommendations. What does the board think about actually um, adopting those recommendations? And um, I'll talk about advocacy in my go back. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Yeah. Next, we have Mr. Moon. Uh, thank you, Mr. McElroy. It is always exciting to start a, a new term with a such topic as CIP and budget. Uh, I, I cannot just hide my excitement doing this again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that said, uh, I, following what uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Frisch, I commented on and jet goals and Ms. Marilyn as well. <clears throat> it's a CIP that's been posted, proposed a CIP that's been posted on the bold dock. A fairly and in good faith comply with directives from the school board regarding jet goals. I think that the, as it's written, the budgeted uh, pages do not um, comply to, completely with the uh, previous board jet goals. Uh, would you be able to show us where we could go to see the deviations from prior board's decisions? I do think when we talk about energy reduction and net zero, it is still new enough that it is open for interpretation. So I will say that projects that are actively under construction and actively under design are considering some net zero technologies. For example, we have, I think all of the, all of the active construction and design projects where we have an addition and there's a new roof, it was built with extra structure to make it solar ready, which is a huge component of achieving on net site net zero. You need to generate power to offset the power you consume, right? I think what our efforts are moving forward are to really interpret net zero as really trying to get that on-site reduction to equal to zero. And I think we need to be more rigorous in our approach to that. And I do think it starts with the CIP planning and budgeting, making sure that we have the funding to have a premium enough HVAC system that's energy efficient enough so that getting to that zero is possible or we're doing it to the fullest extent possible. So for the purposes of transparency to the public and board members as well, uh, that, uh, do you plan to post something somewhere to uh, show to public that there may be a deviation from our previously adopted JET goals? The current proposed CIEP includes those deviations because, you know, if, if it's been already posted, I want to know on which page of a CIP I could go to really uh, be able to share with the public that this is what is being proposed. So what's been posted uh, is currently a draft document. And I think which pages did we, because I know to your point, Mr. Moon, the, for example, geothermal structures are not fully funded for all uh, projects in design at this time. Uh, what page would we draw attention to? And because it's a draft, we can also um, elaborate um, and add more detail to the document prior to it being a final document. 
Yeah, for the, you know, for the purpose of my own education and also being able to share with the public, I would like to know where I could go to get those information Certainly. to share with. Yeah, so that is one. You don't have to answer right now. You know, hopefully you can provide the responses you know, later on. Well, I uh, also, Mr. Moon, I think yes. what I want to say, too, is I think when we looked at preparing for this conversation and looked at what is the definition of becoming zero carbon or carbon neutral. There are a variety of strategies you can use in construction and design. And I think what Ms. Mansky shared is that we've tried uh, to incorporate some of those. I would say it hasn't been as robust an incorporation due to funding and cost escalation of construction. Um, but I think um, we will provide you know, some more That's the kind of information, yeah. that's the kind right. of elaboration that I'm looking for. You know, obviously, yes, I was not on that board who adopted those jet goals and gave the superintendent directives. So, but that was a decision made by the board, and we are honoring, hopefully, but I want to see if there's a deviation, what the deviation is like, be able to share with the public, and we need to be transparent about that. Yes, sir. Uh, sure. Because we will be voting on the CIP. And, and, and the related to that, uh, jet goals were adopted, if I'm not mistaken, not just by our, our board, but board of supervisors as well, uh, how much they are aware of our potential need to deviate from those goals, you know, jointly adopted by the both boards, whether we are planning on having any discussion with the board of supervisors, both on this, I know that they are they have increased the level of cash flow to us uh, to the level of 235 from FI25. Uh, whether we, f we will not stick with our regional jet goals adopted 2021, whether they would require even higher <coughs> level of cash flow, I mean, that may be a worth to be brought to the attention of Board of Supervisors for you know, their consideration as well. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Uh, next to speak is Mr. Dunn. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so I, I have uh, a few questions, um, uh, and I'll just outline them rather than uh, uh, allow you to respond to um, each one individually just to conserve my time. Um, number one, I'd like to know to what extent, if any, FCPS has a team focused on federal grant opportunities for green school construction and renovation, uh, the purchase of electric school buses, uh, et cetera. There are literally billions of dollars available under legislation enacted under uh, President Biden's leadership that could benefit FCPS while reducing the financial burden on Fairfax County taxpayers. and. Um, if CPS does not have such a team, uh, has FCPS considered hiring a vendor to assist with this? Um, I think as reflected in page 10 of your presentation, we're operating in a time of increasing need, lengthening construction timeframes, and increasing budget constraints. So we really need to think outside the box. We need to reconsider our current business practices and look to how to do more with less. Um, my second question is, um, to what extent, if any, has FCPS actively engaged with the construction industry? through requests for information, industry days, and draft uh, requests for proposals, uh, engaging with industry, sharing data, requesting their ideas, seeking best practices and lessons learned would enable FCPS to be more cost effective in its approach to school uh, construction and renovation. Um, third, um, I'd like to know to what extent, if any, FCPS has actively engaged rather than pas passively waiting to be contacted with the construction industry and developers to discuss potential private-public partnerships in which the private sector brings money to the table and contractors assume some or all of the risk for construction overruns as well as maintenance. I note the 33% in uh, construction overruns uh, under a public-private partnership that might have been borne by the contractor rather than FCPS, um, as well as maintenance over uh, 10, 20, or 30 years. Other school districts in our region, as well as many school districts across the across the country utilize public-private partnerships with great success. Uh, for example, South County High School in my district was built uh, successfully through a public-private partnership. And fourth, um, I'm particularly focused on pages 15 to 16 of your presentation. 
Um, as noted, many of the elements that make our schools great, from playground equipment to HVAC equipment, have lifespans significantly shorter than the current renovation cycle of 40 years. Um, and I'll note that for HVAC equipment, the typical duration of 20 to 25 years that maybe our parents enjoyed is closer to 10 if you talk to people in the industry. Uh, what is FCPS doing to ensure that a dedicated portion of school bond funding, perhaps 10 to 20 percent, is allocated to meet these infrastructure requirements uh, over time? I believe that we saw, for example, during the pandemic, the results of having outdated HVAC equipment uh, held together with bubble gum and duct tape. So we need to solve the infrastructure problem now, not later. Um, and thank you very much. So I can answer that first question, Mr. Dunn, around our uh, grants office. So in the Department of Financial Services, we do have a grants team, and they work with uh, our departments and offices across the division in identifying those federal grant opportunities. For transfer, uh, transportation specifically, we were one of the recipients of one of the first transportation uh, grants for uh, electric buses, and we've applied annually for those grants. Uh, and as we look at how those grants are uh, allocated across the country, they oftentimes will try to spread that around. And so we uh, have not been the recipient of those federal dollars, but we still continue to go after them. And I can reply to the other. Uh, and I have to clarify, we were a recipient in the first round, but we haven't been successful in subsequent rounds. But we, again, will continue to uh, go after those dollars. And I believe Mr. Fanshaw can speak more to the engagement he did in the marketplace during his tenure, but since starting with FCPS about four months ago, I've had numerous conversations with some of our uh, industry partners, both working on active projects and ones that I've worked with in other marketplaces and other divisions that might be interested in working. Again, trying to get more interest and competition in the marketplace and just hear some general lessons learned, what would what are their considerations when thinking about bidding on our work? And then also to just getting their general sense on where the marketplace is going. This was, information was used to kind of come up with some of our planning for the CIP and we wanna to continue to engage with our partners because I agree we need to maximize all avenues possible and try to do the most we can and maximize the funding to the fullest extent possible. So I definitely look forward to working with them as partners even more. Uh, we've started to talk to them about opportunities for other procurement methods and even started to engage my team with training on a couple different methods. Again, just trying to expand all of our tools and our tool belt for best getting our best value with the dollars that we have currently. Um, to answer your question on P3s, currently we're under contract on two solar power purchase agreements, so that's the starting of our PPA journey. Uh, at Mason Crest and Annandale, we're under contract with two different vendors where they would use our roof space with uh, little to no upfront cost to us of build and permit uh, solar arrays and then would be charged um, a usage for the electricity. So I definitely see that as a launch pad here at FCPS. Growing beyond to bigger projects, like you mentioned the renovations, we've started to talk to a couple partners in the marketplace that would be interested. Because it is such a new endeavor for FCPS, I think it's good to start asking them the types of questions, their experiences working with similar sized jurisdictions. So we've started those conversations more as information gathering so that, again, I'm open to using tools if it's in the best interest of the division um, and trying to understand what that would mean to do here at FCPS. Um, and then I believe your last question was on the slides 15 and 16. Can you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, so many of the elements that make up our schools from playground equipment to HVAC equipment have lifespans significantly shorter um, than the current renovation cycle of 40 years and, and the quality of equipment from HVAC to playground equipment has much shorter lifespans than historically was the case. Um, whether that's manufacturing or materials, hard to say. Um, but you know, what, what is FCPS doing? Um, I, I, I saw on slide 16, you know, $30 million compared to one billion dollars in need, right? Um, what, what are you considering proposing to the board 
um, as potential solutions, and one solution would be you know, dedicating 10 to 20 percent of school bond funding on an annual basis to infrastructure needs, mm -hmm. not just at one school or particular schools are being renovated, but you know across. And and I'll, I'll say that part of this is, for example, accessibility. Um, you know, wheelchair ramps, elevators, um, and playground equipment that works for for you know neuro neurodiverse children. So um, all of those needs need to be met. Yep, I, I agree with you and I agree on the more portfolio wide approach to that. And so I do agree, like that is one method that we could talk about together with the board on a way to fund that. I think it definitely starts with understanding what our, where our assets are, where our exposures are, where our priorities are. So there is a section in the CIP that goes into more detail in that and I'll even point you to a graph on page 222, where we've taken all those assets that we know about and have categorized them by, um, by type, and then we've gone with manufacturers to really understand what the useful life is for each of those different types of components. For you know, a parking lot, maybe it's 20 years, but for uh, exterior paint, it's 10. So we've started to then break that down by useful life cycle to help better inform us what our needs are and helping to develop priorities with the board. Uh, and, and just as a follow-up, um, I'd ask that while developing like kind of general or industry standard lifespans for playground equipment, HVAC, et cetera, might be useful, um, I would encourage um, FCPS to actually undertake a comprehensive audit, not a random sampling, but a comprehensive audit school by school of all of those systems. Because if you look at my district, for example, Mount Vernon District, Franconia, Springfield, we have historically been underfunded. And I'd also ask that the, um, on num slide 16, the untracked expenditures be tracked. As so, because if you look at athletic facilities, just as one example, um, there's a vast disparity between Eastern Fairfax County and Western Fairfax County. And in the interest of the one Fairfax policy to ensure equity throughout, we need to make sure every school has world-class facilities from athletic to classroom. And, uh, and so Mr. Dunn, your, your time is, is well over. We'll have go backs. Um, but I think Ms. Dr. Reed wanted to reply to one of your points. Yeah, thank you, Mr. McElveen. To the federal grant uh, point, I did want to highlight a recent federal grant, and I want to ask our Chief Operating Officer, Andy Muick, to share the EPA news, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Dunn, as uh, Mr. Smith alluded, we have two folks in transportation specifically focused on uh, the fleet management uh, to include grants, conversion of diesel buses to electric vehicles and everything. And we just recently, at the beginning of this week, were awarded uh, from an EPA grant pool a grant for $16.5 million to buy 42 electric buses. Yes, sir. And they have, a, and there's another grant that's due at the end of this month that um, the transportation fleet team is working on pulling together and should have done in a day or two. So they, they are constantly looking and, and applying as quickly as they can. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dunn. Next uh, to speak uh, is Ms. Dixon. Hello. Um, my question is also regarding uh, the infrastructure replacement requirements. And now... Uh, I'm just seeing it's like, a, you know, $1 billion of money is needed to replace everything, and we only have a part of it. How do you um, say which are the most critical items of this list? And um, I would say there are too many fire sprinkler systems which are out, out of their useful life, which is potential safety issue. Um, so my question is regarding that. How do you prioritize that? Is there a way to see the severity of the, uh, you know, the systems and, and kind of uh, go with that? The oldest get replaced first. And um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, Sully District specifically about uh, what's the update, any update on the construction or uh, sorry, renovation of Centerville High School? So thank you. Um, yeah, so I think you're, you're right on right now when we look at our infrastructure replacements, we are looking and categorizing which assets are past their useful life and prioritizing those and going off of a combination of the condition they're in in the last replacement year and continue to work through that with the funding that we have available. Uh, to speak to Centerville, currently the project is in design and we have an architect team on board and they're working through that. And I can follow up with more information on when we expect that design to go in for county permitting. 
Okay, uh, another follow-up on that. Uh, I was noticing something that in design process, it takes one to three years in any school design, and the construction starts after that. And uh, obviously, um, is that a standard industry uh, timeline? Because um, coming from private industry and seeing buildings being up much faster, is there a reason the design process itself takes one to three years? Yeah, I think we put that range in to be very general depending on the year, the time of year which we end up making the award and um, if there's any possible unforeseen conditions, we try to build that buffer in. I, typically, we end, try to be on the front end of that range and it really does depend on the scale and complexity. Centerville High School's uh, over 400,000 square feet, very complex. It's a high school with much more um, infrastructure-heavy programs like lab spaces and whatnot versus maybe a smaller elementary school. So there is going to always be a range. Again, we were trying to be broad brush enough to kind of cover that whole spectrum. Uh, my last question is about the Western Fairfax um, High School. Has the site been acquired? No, not at this time. Any timeline on that? I can follow up with you on that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dixit. I recognize Mr. McDaniel. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions. The slide calling out the enrollment projections, I think that was slide four. Uh, so the, the third bullet says demographic projections decline in school age population, age group prior to 14 from 2020 to 2025. Have we gone back and compared the projections to actual? I'm gonna ask staff to weigh in on that one. Um, we look at the accuracy each year with our okay. projection set as we develop the next projection set. And there is a dashboard online that has the comparison of division wide as well as by region or by school. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question, and this can be a request for information. Can I get some historical data, five or 10 years, does it matter, of modulars, how many students in, and or per square foot or maybe both students and square feet division wide? Yeah. And then slides 10, the, the circle graph with the funded versus unfunded. Mm -hmm. I just wanna be very clear for the public this does not, when we talk about funded versus unfunded, you have it in the fine print, but it's not called out in the data visual. The data visual does not show what we anticipate to receive in bond funding. So when I see a big scary red circle on the 10 years that shows $2 billion unfunded, that does not take into consideration future bond sales that we anticipate to receive, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. And last question, the slides regarding, uh, slide 16 and 17 regarding the infrastructure replacement requirements, that $1 billion and the $380 million is not reflected in slide 10, the total bond. Correct, that's okay. just for the CIP cash flow of bond projects. So really, the 10-year unfunded, if we throw in the, in, the, the infrastructure replacement is the two billion plus another 1.4 billion. So we're looking at 3.4 billion. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Would anyone who's not spoken like to speak? Okay, at this point I'll recognize Mr. McElveen. Hey, um, I'm sorry, I had my hand up. I know it's hard to see the screen. Okay, Raj, when you're virtual. Ahead. But Ryan, go ahead and go, I can go after no, you, I'm you, fine. You have the floor. Thank you, and I apologize for not being there. I'm a little under the weather this um, afternoon, so you get my big head on the screen instead. So con congratulations on your first work session for the new board. Um, a couple questions. I know the CIP was posted later. I mean, I, I didn't even see it as of last night, and there's a lot of data in here I'd like to dig into. So I would, I think one of my colleagues mentioned having some more time to dig into this, and I, I would welcome that. I really also, um, I think Dr. Anderson mentioned the two by twos, and I found those very useful as well. So uh, although I do understand that we're in this weird space of creating a new renovation queue, so I think the first thing I wanted to lift up is that we need to figure out as a board with um, staff guidance on what are the factors going into our new renovation queue, 
and which include criteria we can all agree on. But in addition, what are the factors we're going to use to determine what might be urgent before then? Right. And is that just sticking with the queue we have now? Are there other things that we need to lift up sooner than that? Are there capacity issues? And I think there's some guidance we need there because we are in this funny space. So that's the first thing I'm going to sort of lift up. The other thing I wanted to lift up is, you know, as Mr. McGinley and Mr. Mead mentioned, there are quite large gaps between what is funded and what is needed, especially on the renovation um, and maintenance issues. And so I really think we need to work on some sort of communications plan around an advocacy plan. You know, if we have you know, 319 million of renovation, I mean, maintenance needed and only 30 million funded for it, that's a problem. And maybe I'm reading the numbers incorrectly as I just looked at this this morning as it was posted. But that's a huge problem that I think our community and our um, funding partners need to be aware of. So I don't know where what that could be. I think that some work maybe between our facility staff and even our um, and Mr. Malloy on our legislative package. So I think that is very important to do. I wanted to mention a couple things about school specific. Um, when we're looking at our renovation queue, and I know um, Candace and I have talked about a, a facility a infrastructure plan. Is there? Do you any of you know historically why the secondary schools did not get renovated like two schools? I mean, they contain a middle school and a, and a um, high school, but there's one theater, there's one track, there's one gym. So when you're talking about equity and um, facility access and equity access, so I'll pause and ask if anyone knows historically why there wasn't more facilities put in place considering there's two schools in one. Ms. Sizemore Heiser, I, I don't think staff has an answer this afternoon, but we will look into that and have an answer in the Friday letter. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I will bring that up because two secondary schools are in the Baddock district, but also, you know, there's always urban legend at Lake Baddock that there was a little theater because at some point there was supposed to be a big theater, right? But I wonder about the equity for middle schoolers and having to share all those facilities. I know it became an issue when we're looking at middle school sports as to whether the secondary schools would be able to do those. So I think that's important when we're looking at our renovation queue to look at that. Um, I also wanted to lift up that there's quite a few schools in Braddock that you're watching, the Capacity Kings Glen, Old Creek, Irving, West Springfield, Woodson. So when you're looking at um, the renovation queue versus urgent issues, I'd like some more information on whether those are urgent needs now. I know some of the same HVAC and other facility look issues um, have affected recruiting a staff for some of those schools. I know my time is up, so I'll pause and just ask if there are urgent needs for those schools now that we need to look at. I can let staff chime in to speak on that and we can definitely follow up if we've identified a very critical need that would need your engagement. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the time. You know, so you ask my questions for a go back. I just want to clarify, are you referring to the schools on page 38 in the of the CIP? You're muted, Rachna. I think my last four years would teach me not to do that. Um, so I, I think it's page 38. I don't. I was looking at some other pages. I don't have the exact page number in front of me, but I noticed Kings Glen is right now 89%, but it's it's projected at 103% with Modular. Old Creek is 109%. Irving is 107%. Lake Braddock numbers is going from 92 to, I think, again, I have right in front of me, 96 or 97. Robinson is trending in the same direction. So um, I just, and I know Old um, Little Run has some facilities issues that I've lifted up before. So as I look at some of these numbers trending in the higher, right, going upwards in terms of capacity, and I know when, when some of those schools are renovated, I just don't know uh, right now. This is something I would have brought my two by two, what urgent needs may be to address for those schools before the renovation here. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Rachna. We enjoyed seeing your big face on the screen. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, so I will go ahead and take my turn, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to um, uh, Ms. Lady. Um, so uh, uh, it's great here to be here with everyone. Um, uh, a lot of similar songs that we've heard in the past, uh, but unfortunately, 
a lot of things have, have kind of gone out of tune over the years. So there were, there were three uh, major shocks that came to me uh, uh, when I was looking through uh, this report. So the first, um, I just want to underscore, is that our renovation cycle over the past four years has increased five years. It used to be 37, now we're at 42. Um, uh, and that was a pretty, pretty big shock. Secondly, um, the bond increase sounds nice. That was something we've, we've, been, we've fought for for many years, uh, and uh, it took a couple joint uh, board committees to get us there. Um, but as others have stated, you know, an increase of, of 30 million when we have indi individual projects that have uh, increased by 100 million or more uh, in cost uh, is, is not going to suffice. Uh, and the 30% cost overruns that we are seeing is, is quite a shock as well. And the third major shock um, is that uh, when, when Mr. Moon and I left the board in 2019, uh, we had a list of um, 90 schools that were solar ready, uh, uh, developed in, in collaboration with the county. Uh, and here we are now at looking at two. Uh, uh, for um, power purchase agreements. Uh, so that is um, a, uh, a major blow. Um, obviously, there are reasons for all of this, and this is not just a, a FCPS problem, this is a county problem as well, um, and they can't place the blame on us um, because we're in this together. Um, but uh, one of the things I would ask for uh, as a result of, of this situation is a clear communication um, that we can send to the community, that we can um, each individually take out there to explain um, what what has happened, and um, because we have legislators breathing down our necks as to why we have had such a massive failure when it comes to, to solar, um, and I do believe it's it's a failure. Um, uh, next, I would just say uh, I agree with uh, Mr. McDaniel on the ominous red circle. Uh, I would, uh, uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, I would like a, um, a breakdown annually of, of the shortfall, uh, both including uh, modulars, trailers, uh, and just uh, for, for renovations. Um, in the old days, it was $273 million, uh, which you'll note is still, uh, still far exceeds the $235 million that, that we have. Um, so I would like that number. I imagine it's in the 300s, if not higher than that now. Um, so that would be grateful. Um, and just while we're on the point of next steps, um, for everyone, I would clarify that um, uh, Christina Setlow has shared a document uh, that where board members will in individually be able to put their next steps on um, at the conclusion of the work session um, within the next three days. Um, that's, that's new to our prior practices. Um, when we used to vote up and down on the screen, uh, maybe that's a, a welcome change for folks. Uh, but uh, please just take note of that. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Lady. Um, and actually, I'm going to recognize uh, Ms. St. John Cunning before I'll speak. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I got that up quick enough. Um, I just had a basic question as we're looking forward, and we talk about educating children now for um, jobs that don't even exist and if we're looking at w how we're going to renovate or build new spaces are we looking at programming in tandem with how we're going to do that and I come from the lens of the concept that maybe there w might be some community school expansion and if that is that is one program of many programs or as uh, Ms. Marin stated different programming that we want in different schools uh, when these decisions are made, are you looking at program requirements as you look at the renovation and as you look at um, building new buildings, number one? And then number two, I just want to point out as someone that has been working in schools for the past 26 years, the infrastructure situation is very real and makes a real impact on students and on staff. And it may not seem like uh, it's a critical issue, and it may not raise to a, be something that is raised to a critical issue when we're looking at it on paper, but in day-to-day -day experience, it truly is. If you're in a very cold building where you can't regulate or classroom or a hot building, I, I just want to state that for the record because that's where I come from, and that's what I can bring to the table. Great. Thanks, Ms. St. John Cunning. Next, uh, Ms. Lady. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you for everyone's comments. Uh, I'm learning a lot as I sit here in this new chair. Um, but um, understanding the, the queue and the new queue and the complications thereof, I just feel I'd be remiss if I didn't piggyback on Dr. Anderson's comment um, and make uh, an ask that McLean High School uh, be also uh, evaluated. Um, we certainly have a major capacity issue. Uh, they were last renovated under the old way that we did renovations, which was piecemeal and patchwork, um, but not a full reno. Um, I am grateful to the previous board for, uh, I believe, voting to um, re replace the bathrooms. And it's my understanding that one set of bathrooms had, was successfully completed over the winter break. So thank you for that. I just want to make sure our community knows that that is happening and the other three will be renovated. Um, and the only other thing I really want to add is that um, I'm very much interested in transparent communication with our community. I believe strongly that we need to repair trust. Um, and to uh, uh, Mr. McElveen's point uh, regarding information, for example, with the solar uh, panels on our schools, I believe that a lot of what's complicated that is absolutely cost. But also, uh, that's my understanding that the, the, we're, the SEC is also uh, looking at uh, Virginia Dominion Powers, um, I guess, uh, ask of about 3,000 to correct us to their panel, um, connect us, should I say. Um, and I just want, those are the things that I think our community needs to understand as they try to follow these things um, because we're partnering with them. Um, and I just want to make sure that the Office of Community uh, Relations uh, works hard to endeavor to be transparent around press releases or otherwise to make sure that they understand uh, what, what's going on and what we're doing um, uh, at our level to, and at, the, and at staff level to address their concerns. Thank you. Great. Uh, okay. With that, uh, we can launch into go backs. I know Dr. Anderson was first on the list for go back, so please proceed. Okay. Um, I just want to check on time because uh, are we still doing three or two? We seem to be really good for time. Okay. Uh, we're going to convert to two minutes now for go backs. It's not even two o'clock. Right. I'm sitting next to the chair. He told me to. Okay. I just don't want to have, <laughs> I don't want to have a go, go back because we are here until 4.30. Okay. Um, if I, I, I would like to advocate for us to keep it at 3 because we have the time and there's a lot here. Okay. I have conferred with the chair. We're going to keep it at 3 for this next round. <laughs> Thank you for Hopefully conferring. Hopefully you can get as much out. Okay. There we yes. go. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of talk about a little bit. I mean, it's very clear from this conversation and previous conversations that our needs have far outpace our resources. And from here and from my colleagues speak around the table, I think there's appetite for additional conversations, which I will lay on the table. Obviously, everyone wants to have um, a di diversification of revenue. We have, you know, Mateo talking about going and really being earnest and pursuing all possible potential partnerships. I know we've had that conversation with the group that I know you're um, following up with. But I also wonder, when will it be time for us to have the conversation with our colleagues on the Board of Supervisors as a group regarding a, a plan that was put forward in 2016 to have the meals tax? Because we could certainly use what was, pro what was proposed at that time, which is 70% to come to the schools. This is 70% of guaranteed money every year. That could help really push forward some of these things, particularly the infrastructure, which is not bonded. So I, I really want to elevate that part of the discussion with my colleagues, and I hope to further that in a forum topic to be coming very soon, because we cannot escape that conversation. Additionally, I wanted to lean in a little bit in terms of something Mr. Mate uh, Mr. Dunn said, which is, would we be, would we have the appetite to take part of the bond in order to deal with the infrastructure um, needs that we have that far exceed the $30 million that we have each year. And I'm going to couple that with what Ms. Lady said, which is how do we have that conversation with our community in earnest? We do not want to diminish the trust from our community because we know when they go out to vote on these bonds, they know, and generally speaking, that we've said it's going to serve school X or school Y. But maybe it's time to have a different conversation with our community so that we could actualize some of these infrastructure issues so we can make sure that we I heard what you said about the cycle being expanded, but that coupled with some other um, initiatives may get us to a narrower timetable. But I, I think it's time for us to really have that conversation in earnest. And I also want to say, as I'm listening to this conversation here, 
I am feeling the appetite to review the queue that we currently have. Is it still serving us? Does it still have what we need to have happen in 2024 Fairfax County? So I'd like to put that on the table to hear what people are thinking, uh, because if we had a set and objective criteria, as the superintendent shared, maybe some of those schools don't meet it. Maybe others do. So I would love to hear with 15 seconds back on the clock. Oh, Ms. Domeski, that's you as well. <laughs> Can you please clarify what you're looking for staff to address? I, I guess I'm looking to see from you, and let me start with the easiest one that Mr. Dunn shared regarding a portion of the bond being able to be utilized for infrastructure needs. And also, Dr. Reed, you could speak about the community engagement. What would it take to have this conversation with our community mm -hmm. if we were to have a different plan for the bonds that have already been passed and voted upon? Yeah, again, I think you bring up a good point as I made mentioned before, there's a lot of moving parts and components to it. So, you know, if the board has an appetite, we can certainly as staff look and see what that does with the model and what it does for where the money was originally intended to go and what are the outcomes. So I think that's something that us as staff could definitely take a look at further. What would that mean, Dr. Reed, for our community engagement? I would say that if we're talking a number of the projects we've discussed are already in design at this time and or have been designed and are in the beginning of construction. And I, it, um, I would certainly want to take a, a hard look at the question you're posing and get back to you. As I sit here right now, it seems like once those designs are put into place, like we're, we're moving on that project for that school. I would also say that if the community feels that they have voted on bond dollars for particular specific school projects, then we ought to keep those commitments to those specific projects. And it's clear that with the cost escalation, there isn't extra money within those bond dollars to do additional projects. Um, we're going to be stretched to meet the targets of the current Q projects. Having said all of that, I think uh, Ms. Dixit's comment about the number of types of maintenance projects and how we prioritize that could be more clear um, to uh, the board and the community. And I think that as we think forward on future or adding to our queue, I think that it's gonna be important to think about what are our business rules that place a school where it does on the queue. And if we could, it would be great to have some consistent business rules that over time don't change because I think that's a challenge to communities who think their time has finally come only to find out something else has been you know, placed in front of them. I think that's what's hard. So it's a, not an easy question to answer, but I think our community would respect us keeping our commitments and being very transparent when we have to make a change in course. And I think the engagement plan that CPDC has worked hard on is also trying to anticipate needs so we're not changing course often. Hopefully we're able to anticipate needs that keep us on course. So those are my thoughts right now, but I'm certainly willing at the board's um, direction to take a deep dive into um, the question you've posed. So let me go back in my nine seconds that are remaining and maybe I'll go to a go-go back. The business rules to which you are referring, is this the phase two? of the queue or is this something you're looking for the board to start to think about and to put together concurrently? I think it would be one and the same as we develop the phase two, take the information that we've gathered to date on feedback and develop some sort of rubric or as Dr. Reed mentioned, business rules as you will to help plug it into the queue and outspits the list. That's something we would definitely wanna consider. Okay. I'll just wait for my go-go back. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, next to speak is Mr. Frisch. Thank you. <clears throat> As to the question about um, augmenting this queue with schools that are not in it, um, I would be inclined, depending on what information we receive back from staff, to, to not support that because 
the schools that are currently on the queue waiting renovation have waited the longest, right? Um, that's why they're at the end of the queue. So the end is in sight. I think what, I think what I'm hearing from this board discussion is a extreme appetite for more resources so that we can address these problems. I think the discussion needs to be there, right? And um, taking money from one to feed the other doesn't get us any closer to the goal, right? All it does is extend this queue. When uh, Mr. McElveen was talking about the 37 uh, year mark for the initial, well not initial, but the previous uh, estimate between renovations, um, I chuckled in uh, because when we got the extra money from the Board of Supervisors, I was so excited to tell people that it was down to 35 years. Um, and then, not too long after that, we started seeing the uptick in costs uh, from COVID, which pushed it far beyond even where we were um, before when we, when we had righteous complaints. Um, so I think we need a holistic approach to determining the, the next queue. I think that's a requirement for that work. Um, and I might add that when I look at a report that tells me in five years' time, many of our schools will be at 55 or 50 percent capacity, and many of our schools it'll be 120, 115 percent capacity, that speaks to the need for other conversations as well um, that uh, I don't think we can delay. Um, and so I look forward to these conversations. I've asked the clerk to, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss with the superintendent about other opportunities for further discussions. Um, and I'll circle back later this week with uh, some information about that and seek board um, input as we move forward. Um, but I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. It is not easy to come to a board uh, of uh, a school board and tell them that um, not only are these projects more expensive, but to actually solve the issues that we've been asked to solve, we need to do things differently and it's gonna take longer and it's gonna cost more money. Um, but that's the kind of transparency we, we expect as a board, and that's the tra uh, kind of transparency that the, the public expects as well. So as we continue these conversations, my mind will be on two things. One, being transparent, and two, uh, holding fast to our goal of being uh, you know, uh, equitable with the projects that we pursue and ensuring that we are thinking about the far term, uh, the far far away future um, and that we are sticking to our climate goals and the JET uh, directives of this board. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. At this point, I'll recognize Mr. Moon for a go back. Thank you, Ms. Lady. Uh, just a couple of questions. First one has to do with the new renovation queue, the timeline. This is for my own clarification. Just wanted to make sure that I, I understood this correctly. So are we done with the phase one, or are we toward the very end of the phase one? So we have set criteria, or are we still setting criteria? I'm gonna ask Mr. Fanshawe to answer that, please. You've been most, um, how do I say, intimate with that. <laughs> uh, no, I would say we're not, I said the criteria is not, has not been set. Has not been set. No. So has that worked? begun or hasn't begun? I'd say the conversation was held and some ideas were generated uh, before uh, the strategic plan was complete. So I would think uh, a prudent uh, course may relook at the previous discussion in light of how does it align or not align with the strategic plan and then to further uh, uh, develop the criteria that satisfies um, not only the alignment with the, with the strategic plan and the ideas that were put out previously. Okay, I guess this question then goes to our superintendent. Are you planning on updating us sometime soon or we're yes, going to wait until next year for the CIP discussion on this one, or? When you what, say update us, update us. what specifically? You know, what, what is being done, will be done, and when that will be done. Or, or if you are asking for further input from school board, when you are asking for that input from us. So I think that um, we certainly can provide further information. I think that we have... 
a bit of a script that had some specific buildings that we were looking at. I don't know if you want to share that at this time, Ms. Siminski. Sure. So we as staff can follow up with a timeline or anticipated timeline for developing this queue. One of the big components of the queue, though, is really understanding the state of facilities. And so part of these efforts is to develop a facility condition assessment, because it's going to be a big weighted factor when it comes to developing the queue. Currently, we have staff working on a scope of work for that project. It's almost a standalone thing that informs the queue process. And so with staff developing the scope of work, we're actually looking to model the city of Fairfax recently underwent a very similar project. We've gotten a copy of their RFP and we're looking to develop our version of that as another next step to, to answering your question. But we will follow up with a more broad timeline on the developing the queue itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, Dr. Reed, uh, it may be just this one school board member, but something I would hate to do is, after a work session like this and going out to the public, when public asks me a question, my answer to be, I don't know. I don't know when that's going to happen because, because I don't know. I mean, that is the last thing I want to do. I mean, that's just, I wanted to share with you as a one board member. Or it may be okay with other board members. They are maybe a little more patient than I am, but I'm not. That's, I wanted to share with you. And having said that, with the one minute and 30 seconds left, let me go to infrastructure replacement budget. Uh, this is something mentioned by uh, Ms. Seismerheiser uh, that our, for our, you know, including current backlog, our need up until FI 2019, that's a five year period, is close to $380 million, according to staff's presentation. At the same time, a, our infrastructure replacement budget for FI 24 was only 30 million. And if we just use the same number, for the next five years, we'll only have about 150 million, which, which means, uh, we are about $230 million deficient for our needs. So, uh, is there a way for you to share with us? I don't know whether you have this ready or you have to come up with a little more research looking into this, but uh, it is general understanding by people that when you delay replacing certain things, that there are implications. You know, this it is not being able to replace a, a infrastructure on a timely fashion. I mean, I have to assume that will have impact, negative impact on our programs, operational school system, and even on the long-term cost. Uh, whether you will be able to a uh, verbalize you know, describe those impacts, including whether you'll be able to quantify, quantify long-term costs not being able to, long-term financial costs not being able to replace this infrastructure in timely manner. And also, if I want to go one step, oops, my time is up. I just wanted to see whether there is a comparison between our needs versus county board of supervisors needs. Because, su because the money will have to come from supervisors, and supervisors always talk about their old needs not being met. I wanted to see how we are compared to uh, county government's needs. So I think what we could do is, I, I certainly agree that uh, maintenance deferred is maintenance problematic, right? I mean, in fact, we're reaping those outcomes right now across the board in a number of areas. So, but we also don't have the funds to resource the maintenance needs we currently have. So I think I will ask staff if we can calculate the cost of not conducting maintenance, I believe is what you're asking. And um, we can certainly conduct that cost because that, or I sort of, I would say construct that cost analysis um, and then couple that with the current uh, expense uh, to maintain the resources to uh, look at. Um, it might actually be cheaper to pay it now, obviously, than let everything uh, continue as we are. And I think, to your point, it makes certainly 
um, for a rich conversation with the Board of Supervisors because at the end of the day, our resources are our county's resources. We talk about one Fairfax and it's sort of one maintenance plan as well. There are, our facilities are used um, by um, our children, our staff, our community um, across the board. So I think um, we'll ask staff to see. I can't promise for by this Friday, but we'll work on that for the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. Yes, sir. And I think what we can provide is maybe more of a broader range. The thing about preventative maintenance and, and assets is that I can't predict accurately, hey, in five years, three HVAC systems are going to break. Uh, what we can predict is using manufacturer's recommendations, the anticipated useful life, how many are at that point where they're at or past their useful life, we can quantify how many years passed and sort of give you that range of risk, I think would probably be the next best step for you. Because at the end of the day, I want to be able to bring this to public and bring this to a board of supervisors. Understood. All right, thank you. At this point, I'd like to recognize Mr. Dunn for a go back. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a few more questions, and again, I'll read the questions. Uh, first, uh, when students go to school today, uh, where they go to school is determined by school boundaries that were established nearly 40 years ago. Um, many schools are under capacity and other schools are over capacity. Uh, my question is, if FCPS were to undertake a comprehensive review of school boundaries across the county, what effect would that have on school construction and renovation, available funding, and would it have beneficial financial impacts? Uh, my second question is, uh, early education, especially pre-kindergarten, is one of the most effective mechanisms to reduce the achievement gaps that exist throughout our county. Uh, there's been some movement, but not sufficient, to establish a universal pre-K in Fairfax County, but I believe it, we all agree it's inevitable that it will happen. So to what degree is FCPS planning for the potential universal expansion of pre-K? Uh, my third question is, uh, can you please provide an update on the security vestibules? It appears from the presentation that it's been accelerated, but I'd like to know when all security vestibules will be uh, completely constructed at all schools in Fairfax County. And I'd also like to know, are high schools and middle schools being included in that because they have a lot more entrances? Uh, my fourth question is, uh, it's my understanding that the recent security audit was a random sampling rather than a comprehensive audit of every single school building. Um, as a parent, there's no greater worry or concern than random gun violence. Um, I think random sampling is great from a statistical perspective, but it gives me no security from a parental or educator perspective. So when will FCPS perform a security audit of every single school building, at least in my district, the Mount Vernon district? Um, uh, fifth, um, as a security measure, video cameras inside and outside every school are necessary. I was a bit disturbed to learn last year that FCPS relies primarily or exclusively on grants for this purpose. So when will FCPS use its available funding, operational or school bond, to make sure that every school has updated HD day and night video cameras uh, for inside and outside? Uh, six, when will every trailer be eliminated at every school? Um, eighth, uh, you had mentioned having conversations with a couple of construction firms, and I applaud your initial efforts, but I, as a government contracting attorney, I do want to encourage you to utilize formal procurement mechanisms, uh, such as requests for information and industry days, so that you're inviting the entire public, not just people you may have experienced in prior positions, and that may be familiar with FCPS, but firms that may be new to FCPS, new to Fairfax County, to come in, including citizens, because we have a lot of highly educated, very experienced citizens, some retired, some actively employed, um, who can contribute great ideas and tell us how we can do things better. Um, uh, ninth, has FCPS considered green roofs and white roofs to reduce heating and cooling costs? Um, and finally, to what extent has FCPS considered working with the county to construct multi-use facilities? For example, uh, Lorton Community Action Center combines a library, athletic space, meeting facilities, and a playground. Uh, Fairfax County elsewhere has constructed a police station with a library. Um, to what extent could we combine costs and thus reduce our construction costs so the county is paying some of the costs. Oh, um, thank you for those questions. Um, I think that the, I'll try to be brief, there were a number of questions. 
Uh, the boundary conversation, I don't know that it will impact funding, but it might impact decisions on which schools to renovate or remodel or where to site any new schools that are projected. Um, so to that end, I think it has, um, it certainly is a foundational piece to a larger conversation. Uh, it also goes to uh, Ms. St. John Cunning's comment about the types of programs uh, we're planning to have in schools if we move to a more uh, multi-age option versus uh, not so much or how we design our learning spaces uh, also has a great deal to do with the age of students that are in a school and so forth. So I think there's a lot to unpack there. Early education, I think the board, um, our former board had a high interest in that and are committed to that. We've set aside funding um, to increase particularly inclusive preschool and we know that's a high priority and certainly look to Richmond to more fully fund that because we know closing achievement gaps is best done the younger um, our age group. The security audit you're referring to, we did have um, an external security audit that was done in addition to annual school reviews that are done by our um, Office of Safety and Security. So all schools are reviewed um, annually, I believe. That is correct. All schools are reviewed annually. This just happened to be another external audit where folks came in and um, went through a variety of protocols, I believe, on at least 27 campuses. Uh, there were some consistent themes and patterns and um, action steps that we're taking as a division as a result of that. The cameras were utilizing some mid-year dollars, one-time only dollars, to supplement uh, grant dollars. But as you've seen on our maintenance projects, it's, you know, cameras would sit with sprinkler systems and all of the other types of um, maintenance projects that honestly are being deferred to Mr. Moon's point, to what end and at what cost. Um, but we are certainly working on adding cameras to those schools that are not. The security vestibules, I don't have an actual tight date that's mission certain uh, or date certain when those are done, and I'm not seeing that staff do, but I will do my best to get you information about that. When we would have every trailer removed, I, I don't know that I have a, a date certain for that as well. I think that's part of our renovation plan and perhaps boundary discussion. And um, so I think everyone could look forward to a day when we don't have trailers. Uh, the green roof, right, white roof uh, county project, I think the solar ready construction that we're talking about is a step in that direction. I have to say I'm not, my wheelhouse is not green roof, white roof. Those aren't terms I'm familiar with. Janice, do you want to, or Ms. Zeminski, do you want to comment on that before I talk about, actually I'll talk about multi-use centers and then you can comment because then I think we're done. Multi-use centers, we're still struggling to get the schools in our own queue done at this point. I think for future um, visioning, great idea. So, white roof, green roof. Sure. So right now, most of our big bond projects where we're replacing the roof or adding new roofs, we're focusing more on solar readiness, and especially in instances where one of the big benefits of green roofs is your um, stormwater management and water retention. Ideally, if that can be achieved on site, on the ground, water belongs on the ground, then we would like the opportunity to utilize the roof as real estate for solar arrays. I do think in instances where you might have a tight site and you can't optimize in a cost-effective way uh, water retention on the ground, that's when we would look to bring it up to the roof. And so that's sort of been our guidepost as we think about, is it green roof, is it solar roof, and what are those priorities? All right, thank you. At this point, I'd like to recognize Ms. Marin for a go back. Okay, so I think to follow on Ms. Lady, your point about explaining the bond to the community, that's really essential. I think our bond committee provides invaluable services, but to my experience, some communities don't understand what the bond is and that the $3 billion we get annually is not going to contribute to our capital funding. Um, Ms. Massey, can you please remind us how many structures the county government has that it maintains, the county government? You know, I'll have to get staff to help me get that number. I was seeing in their CIP a 12 million square foot uh, number being referenced, but I think it excluded parks and housing. So I would need to follow up to confirm that. Um, I do know right now for FCPS, we are at about approximately 28 million square feet. Okay, so we are double the amount of the county. 
Um, I think, look, let me just, before I get into the advocacy, actually, I didn't scroll up enough on my notes. The renovation queue, I was glad to hear some of the conversations about reviewing the, re the renovation queue. And at what point does SCPS cut its losses on design fees so that more benefits are seen by more people? So for instance, we had mentioned the security audit, which this board does not have the opportunity to discuss yet. But could we have a little for everyone rather than a lot for some? So I am fairly confident that residents would be okay with having basic security features updated and working in, in all the schools. Um, instead of, again, decades at a time for a school to be done. I mean, I have families where they have one student in one school and it's new, and one student in one school and it's renovated. But there's other families that come to the system without that history, and they might be walking into a brand new school, and that's great, but they don't have this sense of they've been waiting. So I think that mentality might need to shift when, again, with the security needs, where I have met much more parents and families asking me they want to guard, well, that's a, um, personnel, but they want to make sure they have all the appropriate fencing. Fencing is a huge issue. Um, making sure all the alarms are issues, our door locks. So I've heard those things more often than I'm waiting for my whole school to get renovated. And I think that even that mindset, we could have that conversation about what does it mean to renovate a school? Is it to do a whole top to bottom everywhere renovation? Or do we want to make sure every school has the proper amount of bathrooms that are modern and gender appropriate or gender inclusive rather? Um, you know, I think that that's the kind of conversation the board can have to really inform this work. I also want to say, um, well, first, Dr. Reed, I just have, actually have a question for you. Can the board receive a report of how the emergency federal funds used during COVID were spent on HVAC and facility-related um, uh, or health-related? Because I know we approved funding, and I'm really surprised that there's so many issues with HVAC. Yes, ma'am. We'll Thank you. Get that. And um, I will quickly say, I appreciate the details about split feeders being included on page 251. And I'd like to know, Dr. Reed, what you and your staff know about the impact of split feeders on students' experience and success. So I don't know if Fairfax County's done a, an audit on split feeder uh, success. I think that um, it can be positive and it can be detrimental, right? I think that children make friends and develop relationships and if they then end up going to separate next schools, those transitions become more difficult. Uh, there are also students who make choices to go to programs that might be different than programs that they're neighbors or friends are going to because they want a different program. So I, I think the research is mixed, but in general, we would like to have uh, fewer mixed feed or fewer split feeders, in particular for our students who uh, might struggle with relationships. Uh, we have some programs that only exist at certain sites, and then it takes students out of their neighborhoods and their peer group. I think I see your face. You know how I feel about that. I do know how you feel about it, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, um, I think that uh, it goes back to Mr. Frisch's comment and um, others in terms of uh, the need, perhaps, of Mr. Dunn talking about boundaries, uh, because you can't resolve split feeders unless you resolve boundaries. Thank you. I'll mention super briefly about special education classrooms. We have a, a rising um, a number of students who are identified for needs. By and large, the um, accommodations are to have a lower staff to student ratio. So that is directly going to impact the ability of our classrooms and our class sizes. Just a, a fine point about advocacy that was raised about the county. I love what you said, Dr. Reed, about one Fairfax, one maintenance plan. The board has a regular conversation around compensation when we do budget. People ask, why does the county have their scale and we have our scale? They have their retirement benefits. We have, not that I'm, I'm not saying get rid of any retirement benefits, to be clear. But I'm just saying that we have two, we have lots of different systems and we have one county. When I look at all of the environmentally focused um, elements on the county's plan, resilient Fairfax, operational energy strategy, green building policy, why is FCPS excluded? I think it's a great topic for our upcoming retreat with the board. I'm sure they'd welcome that discussion. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. And I'll now recognize Ms. Dixit for go back. Uh, I have a question about uh, the contracting process. Um, as we can see, so much of uh, dollars are spent into uh, this building, the schools. Uh, what are the pro contracting process you are uh, following? Uh, is it firm fixed price or cost plus? Uh, those are the question I have because 33% uh, higher cost uh, could be uh, reduced by a different contracting process. Sure. Well, we implement a couple different procurement methods, but here for our big uh, renovation projects, our big bond projects, we're doing um, low bid 
uh, competitive seal. So that is one thing my team and I are looking to explore further. You know, I think there's pros and cons of different procurement methods, and we should always look to providing the right procurement method tailored to the risks and the scopes of our individual projects. So our team's undergone some training on some other procurement methods that might be advantageous to large scale complex projects. Again, with the overall effort of getting the best value, not just in terms of dollar value, but in terms of quality of product, of timeliness of product. And so we wanna make sure we've left no stone unturned when it comes to you know, maximizing our procurement tools and our and those methodologies. So, are you saying that, um, that even though somebody got the award, they were able to come and ask for more money? Sure. I mean, right now, again, we're using low bid price. So, if there is a change in that work, again, that's a again a lump sum that's been submitted. If they were low, they get the award, but say an unforeseen condition were to arise or a change in the work. Uh, right now, our architects are contracted separate from our general contractors, so if something was missed on a drawing, if the drawings weren't as tight as they could be, then there could be entitlement for the general contractor to come back and ask for more funds. And so those are some of the typical things you might see in an everyday renovation that would cause for change orders to happen. Yeah, I understand that. Uh but if, you, if, if the architect is producing a plan, that's a scope of work goes to the construction. So how can... I see. Yeah, I think that means we need to be very mindful during our design process to making sure that we're putting controls in place so that the drawings being designed are accurate to the budget that we have in hand. Again, I think the last few years it's been very unpredictable. So we used to kind of go through that, have good rules of thumb, make sure, yes, this design is reflective of the budget we have. It's been very difficult in recent years. So that's why we're trying to, again, start by reconciling to make sure we do have the right budget for our ed specs, for our goals of the project before it even starts. But then to your point, we really need to make sure through design we're monitoring that, we're maintaining it. And I do think looking at other methods for procurement could be advantageous, especially when it comes to that pre-construction services. Okay, I still have time. So do I have to ask uh, that, uh, is there any um, penalty for any contractor not to uh, you know, construct at a certain timeline or they are just given a free pass? That would be a good question for our contracts and procurement team. I'd have to see what language we currently have in our contract and is something we could look at for future contracts. Okay, thank you. Uh, my other questions is, uh, I don't know who to answer that. It's about revenue. As we know, that's the primary source of our construction plan. Um, we are, obviously the property prices are going up in Fairfax County. There is no way to show that how much more uh, funding we might be getting as a projection from the as the real estate values are going and the, that leads to higher tax amount on the property tax. And I'll stop at that, then I have another question. So Ms. Dixit, are you asking us to sort of um, forecast how the revenue for the county would increase based on the property tax increase or property value increases? Correct. Okay, so Mr. Smith, do you have any thought on that? I know Ms. Burden's out today. Yeah, Ms. Burden is out. I know that we work very closely with county staff uh, and at the fiscal forecast, uh, the boards were given an update as to where uh, county staff feel that real estate values are going. We can certainly get some clarity uh, from the county, but again, it's their staff who uh, do those value assessments, uh, but we can provide uh, the board with, with some additional information after conferring with them. Thank you. Uh, the last question is about uh, use of school buildings. Um, it's a biggest asset for our schools, like, you know, the, the building itself is a biggest asset. Uh, and I know in the past when I was trying to get a uh, rental at the at this one of the school buildings as a part of a nonprofit organization, I was asked for a $1 million insurance to even get 
a room for one hour. So I feel there is a lot of barriers to entry when you come to, when you come to um, get a rental at the you know use the building, and that could be a revenue not too big, but at at with as a, with time it could increase because a lot of people are now looking at our buildings to rent them out when the schools are not in session. That was my last question. And we can provide some more information. Uh, that area is under uh, Mr. Muick for community use. And we pr uh, have actually gone through a couple of audits from, I see Ms. Coe uh, sitting there uh, in the room. And uh, our community use has actually gone through uh, several comprehensive audits from her office. Uh, and we've talked about some of the issues and specifically around the insurance rates and also looking at overall uh, building use rates. And so we can provide uh, the board an update from some of those reports from Ms. Koza or work with her office to get that provided to the board. Uh, and then also work with Mr. Muick's team to see uh, what recommendations we might have for that work. All right, at this point, I'd like to re recognize Mr. McDaniel for go back. A question and then comment. Can we get to Mr. McElveen's point? You know, having 99 schools ready for solar, and today two have been accomplished, could we get a response from staff why that's the case, what obstacles and barriers that we're facing? Uh, and that can just be uh, at a later point in time. So, Mr. McDaniel, I can speak to that, I think. Number one, I didn't realize we had 90 schools solar ready, so I'm not entirely sure what that meant to be solar ready. But when I arrived, we were still negotiating the contract to have solar panels, um, because that had been with legal and contract services and procurement. Mr. Fanshaw is looking <laughs> familiar because you and I were trying to untangle where we were on that topic. Um, Mr. Foster also. So it wasn't until very recently that we were able to finalize the contract with vendors for the solar panels for Annandale and Mason Crest. So I don't, I will be curious, I'm gonna ask staff to go back and find out what the other 88 schools were, but it was essentially contract negotiations that I think had been going on for years uh, prior to my arrival, and we were actually pretty excited to finalize the contract and get moving, and just as we were getting ready, then Dominion came in with a different type of a I don't want to, it's some type of a charge. And I've recently, in fact, last week spoke to Brian Hill at the county and asked for some intercession with Dominion to mitigate fees so that we could um, make those connections now that we have a vendor with the solar panel project. And I don't know, Mr. Fanshaw, if you want to add to that. Sure. I think one of the, the what Dr. Reed mentioned is uh, Dominion. Um, imposed a fee on both of the vendors to connect for safety reasons uh, to their net to their network um, which is uh, dark, dark, yeah, the dark it's, fiber. A, it's an upgrade to the yeah. infrastructure it's a dark fiber interconnection fee and so for any system over a certain size and schools will be a clinical it's not a residential it's a commercial installment we were anticipating an added cost of at least $300,000 per school. So as you can mention, as we were negotiating through on some of these, this definitely threw a bit of a wrench in that. And so right now the SEC is in review um, with some solar advocates arguing against the necessity of this. So we're kind of waiting and seeing and taking our legal guidance. In the meantime, we are looking with those two vendors to see, hey, if this is a requirement, what would that do to our rates? Would it still be financially advantageous to keep going? Uh, we've also gotten a little creative talking to some vendors, seeing, hey, would a cellular connection, um, which would be maybe a tenth of the cost, would that be permissible to Dominion? So we're having um, our solar vendors take a couple look, look at other options or finding ways around this. But as you can imagine, this is all kind of unfolding in real time. So I'm happy to provide an update of where we are today, knowing that as we get more uh, information from the SCC, that could change. But we're still trying to see how much we can move this forward. Sure. No, go ahead. And with regard to the previous list, so there was uh, an initial list when we had, uh, were working with different vendors in the county. Uh, and uh, based on the criteria at the time, looking for those schools who 
might not necessarily be roof ready, but you know, ready for further review for solar. And so I think that as that was communicated with that particular set of vendors and working with different vendors, we find that we're in a different place now in terms of uh, that roof readiness, but we can provide some information to the board around the decisions that were made at that time with those particular vendors and how we've gotten to this point today. Okay, and a timeline of how we anticipate to carry it forward would be mm -hmm. great as well. Um, I, I think based on the, the conversation, this would be the first of many long-term conversations on not only uh, the Q policies, but potentially on, on boundaries as well, but fundamentally what this all boils down to is is funding, and I think everybody around this table knows that, so I'm looking forward to having those conversations with our partners um, just down the road, so that's all. Thank you. Um, at, at this point, I'm just going in the order of that I recognize people to speak at first, so Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, do you have anything you want to speak to as a go back? Okay, seeing as though she may not be near her uh, microphone, I'm going to recognize Ms. St. John Cunning. Thank you. I just really want to thank everyone for being very intentional in their questions, and thank you for your report. Um, I concur with Mr. McDaniel. I think that there's a lot of things that we're going to have to look into. I think that there are people around this table that want pretty much the same thing, but we're all going to have to be creative and figure out how we're going to accomplish a lot of things with a lot less. But I really want to thank everybody for their work. Thank you. Mr. McElveen? Um, uh, I personally have nothing further, only to foot stomp uh, what um, Seema, uh, Ms. Dixit brought up regarding community use. Um, I think this is, we've seen fees escalate. We've seen the insurance policy implemented. Supposedly, I've heard blame on the prior board, on, on the prior, prior board for doing that. And I don't recall doing that, but, but may, maybe we did. So we need to look at that again. Okay, so um, now um, why don't we do a, um, if, if it's okay with everyone, a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for um, third go backs, which will be two minutes each. Okay, so we will reconvene at uh, 2.42. Okay. Okay, so um Miss Sizemore Heiser wanted to go so can we reset the clock to three and then revert it back to two quickly? Okay, Rachna, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and thank you for getting to me. Um, I just wanted to sum up a few things that I think I'm hearing from everybody. Um, the renovation queue is the first thing I wanted to mention. I know that the previous board had talked about it, but it seemed like something that would be really the purview of this board. But what I'm not really seeing right now is sort of a, um, a, a project management plan, for lack of a better word, or a plan for this renovation queue. Right, I know, um, Ms. Minsky, I really appreciate you mentioning kind of a facilities assessment while right, you looking at what Fairfax City is doing, but I would love to see some sort of plan of what are the steps we're going to take to get to the completion of the renovation queue. What is the, you know, what assessments do we need to do? What is the role of the board? What in community engagement do we need to do? Potentially what advocacy do we need to do? What's the timeline, right? So we all are clear on the process and, you know, the steps to get to this renovation queue. And I'd, again, love to see some analysis on urgency and need in between. I tend to be with Mr. Frisch that I think we should be looking forward at what the renovation queue should be. So that's the first sort of thing I would lift up. The other thing I think that's really important, Dr. Reed and Ms. Smithy and me working with OCCR um, or, or Lisa Lundberg Hall is an advocacy plan with talking points. 
including responses to any sort of pushback we may get on some of these issues. Like, what does their maintenance backlog, what's the impact on safety and security, getting rid of trailers, sprinklers, accessible spaces, sensory spaces, environmental, jet goals, cost of community use, costs long-term versus short-term of this maintenance backlog. I think we all kind of have ideas and we talk about it, but I think having a really clear talking point so when we're out in the community to help people understand what does the bond pay for versus operating funds. I think that's would be really helpful for us to have. And then sort of in response to that, what's the plan for us to um, address our backlog of funding? Right, is that advocating to the Board of Supervisors and what does that advocacy look like? Is that the state? Is that grant funding? Is it all of the above and what does that look like? I, I do think we need a community engagement plan um, that takes both of those into account, right? And then also that looks at what's the impact of capacity funding and um, program placement and equity access to program and also individual needs of a school, right? In a Burke school, with the population that Burke school have, what their facility needs may be, may be different than um, a, a different second uh, middle school or elementary school. The secondary schools, I really need to look at that. Mrs. Minsky, you and I have talked about what are our rules around letting outside organizations build facilities, right? Do we have an ed spec for athletic fields? Do we have an ed spec um, that includes if a booster organization wants to build something, what um, do we have any permitting process for that internally? Um, and I think we do need to look at the procurement process as well to Ms. Dixit's point, right? With these cost overruns, with the cost of inflation, the cost of building, how is that built into a contract to um, insulate us from this cost overrun? So, you know, I'll kind of stop there, but I, I think I feel an, a, sort of an appetite for a sort of how you did the strategic plan, right? Here's what the pieces are to get from point A to point B. I, I see that appetite here as well. So thank you. Any comments, I welcome those. I think, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, that obviously um, at this point, defining the queue and then how we're going to get to the end of the queue um, would be an excellent project management plan. And uh, I think staff are nodding and we'll be taking notes and do a draft um, for an upcoming Friday letter. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. I appreciate it. This means can be your new and you had to come up to speed on a lot of things. Okay, thanks, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. So um, I see we have uh, two um, placards raised. So um, we'll go to Dr. Anderson first. Thank you. Just a couple of things, one for consideration and one just more of an inquiry. Um, when I worked in Loudoun, one of the things that they did with all of the schools that they're building every five minutes is to have pretty much three different design plans, and they just rotated across the three. And frankly, they were the same design plan with just a different color scheme. Have we given any thought to having kind of a template which will really reduce costs because every time we have a project, it's a new design plan, it's a new committee. I'm just wondering to hear how that may land here. And I can uh, have Mr. Fanshaw chime in, but I believe we have it here at Fairfax utilized the prototype approach where applicable. Is that correct? Yeah, right, and it, it works well with new construction and new schools, not so much with renovations, because each of those facilities is unique and its issues are unique so you do have to dive into the what are we trying to solve and what do we need to add to bring us up to the current ed spec so I think it, I'm a big I've used prototype schools before <clears throat> they work great and they drive costs down but it's new schools and I believe that was originally at first considered for Dunloring but then again you also have to factor in is the site advantageous can you actually plop it down appropriately are you going to have to make some modifications and at some point does it just make more sense to have a responsive design to that site to those existing conditions and I'll and I'll echo what Mr. Fanshaw said we have mostly renovation projects that we do and on top of that they're occupied while they're under construction so we need to be really mindful and strategic that when we're even adding new construction to a building it has to work with still safe logistics, safe operations throughout the life of construction. So I think because of that, it usually does end up becoming very nuanced and one-off, and that's probably why we're not seeing too much prototype design for our renovations. But I think it's a good point. I mean, it just brings up the point to really maximize all the tools you have for 
you know, getting the best bang for your buck uh, if we have finite resources. But in terms of maximizing tools, if we were to be able to secure a swing space <clears throat> and not have occupied construction, what would be the impact to the timetable and the cost? Oh, I would certainly be willing to take a look at that and analyze that. It's one that I implemented uh, with another division. So, again, there's pros and cons. You have to update and provide that temporary space. So that does have an investment component. However, it does allow for a lot more flexibility on the design. You know, you're not beholden again to certain design moves because you have to have the building occupied. Um, it allows you to construct a little bit quicker. So we might be able to get the construction timelines condensed. So again, I, def I definitely see pros and cons to both. And uh, my time is going while she's speaking. I'm so sorry. Okay. And, and so, yeah, I definitely think if it makes sense from a logistics standpoint, if there's a facility that would meet that temporary need and it's well, relatively close and we could uh, take a look at that. I would be very curious to see how that can be um, impactful. You kind of raised a question that's been coming to me as of late, only because in CPDC we had a lot of those conversations regarding Dunloring. Um, it wasn't a bonded project because that was originally Blake Lane. And I know back in 2020... No? Okay, so can, Marty's gone. Um, can somebody speak to kind of that original thinking for me, please? Because I have a follow-up question. Uh, uh, Ms. Gillis? I can also, go ahead, Jessica. I can pull up what I sent in the Friday letter. I sent an update on that. Go ahead, Jessica. <clears throat> so the original thinking for Den Loring, is that the question? Yes. Sure, so the original bond project was the Fairfax Oakton Elementary School and the anticipated site was the Blake Lane Park and when that was not an approved site by the county we looked for um, another possible site to use those funds and at the time we were struggling with overcrowding at Shrevewood, I think Stenwood, um, Mosby Woods was a renovation project but it was several years down the line and was the AAP Center and there were a few other projects in the neighborhood and also looking at the, reno or the development that was happening in Tyson's in the periphery. We discussed moving the <coughs> um, identified project of Fairfax Oakton to the Dunloring site, which was an, a, an identified repurposing and the a reuse of the facility in the CIP for several years at the time. So I believe it was a forum topic that was discussed and approved by the board. Yeah. No, it, it was. Okay. Um, the reason why I brought it up, because again, we discussed it in CBDC, Mr. Fanshawe will remember, it was repurposing that is now a completely new construction. Is, that's correct. So that's a different cost. Correct. Right now, the proposed plan for Dunloring is new construction. I think I, Mr. Fanshawe can speak more to it, <clears throat> but that was a decision actually driven by cost because I believe the existing building had different elevations, there's a quite steep uh, topography and whatnot, so actually we were finding it was costing more to retain parts of that building than to just tear it down. And Dunloring is a great opportunity to do that because we don't have students in it. So uh, our options were a little bit broader here and we had the opportunity to do new construction. And Dr. Anderson, I, uh, I think Mr. Frisch wants to reply as well. Oh, I can use if, my if, time. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I just have one more. I don't have a lot of time. I don't know if you wanted to add something, Mr. Fanshawe. No, I mean, I think she covered where okay. we are. And so is the new Dunloring going to address, the, and again, not my area, so I don't know. I just have inquiries from my community. Is the new Dunloring going to impact the same schools that Ms. Gillis just talked about, um, Shrevewood, Stenwood, Mosby Woods? Is it still going to be those schools that are um, going to have their capacity be reduced by the new Dunloring? <clears throat> so our current process is that when we go under construction for Dunloring, we've agreed as a body to go forward with a boundary discussion at the same time. So um, we're designing it as a K-6 elementary school, um, as opposed to when we built the uh, McNair Upper, which was a split um, three through six elementary school, there was no discussion about that. So the boundary um, has yet to be established. So those schools were the schools that were overcrowded at the time of the discussion, and the schools to be included in that boundary um, study have yet to be identified. And because I didn't look at this, are these schools still overcrowded currently? 
you mentioned at the time of the discussion. It has not changed, or? There has been some change. Hold, hold one second. While they're pulling that up, we can get where that projection has gone. Our team, when they develop projections, don't look at any planned developments. They only look at projects that are actively under construction that you can really quantify. So I think one of the benefits of the Dunloring project identified by the planning team is that it addresses the long-term growth in this geographical region that's not necessarily quantified in the projections. But I'll let them speak to the actual data and any change since um, since then. Yeah, so the, project, the, the existing capacity utilization has gone down a little bit since then, uh, but Stenwood's currently 97%, Shreveport's 95%, Fair Hills adjacent to where the property sits in Stenwood at 96%, and then Pine Spring is also adjacent to Shreveport at 116. And you can go out from there. It's on page 86 of the CIP. Oh, thank you. And those would be most likely the sites in consideration for the boundary that Ms. Gillis talked about? The site sits in Stenwood, so logic would be anything that surrounds it is potentially impacted, but until we go through the process, we couldn't say. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, great. Next, I have uh, Mr. Dunn followed by Mr. Moon. Um, uh, um, I'd like to, uh, first I'd like to ask Mount Vernon High School to be considered part of the Q renovation since we're making those requests. Um, second, uh, I'd like to request a comprehensive evaluation of traffic signage in our neighborhoods uh, to the extent that FCPS plays any role, and I understand they do. Um, I learned recently that Washington Mill Elementary School does not have the appropriate signage saying this is a school zone slow down uh, all throughout Fairfax County and, and pretty much everywhere in the U.S. We're seeing too many people speeding in our neighborhoods, um, partly Google Maps or whatever reason you want to give. Um, so if FCPS could please undertake a comprehensive evaluation, not just for Washington Mill, but all schools, at least in the Mount Vernon District, to make sure that we have signs telling people it's a school zone slow down. Um, I'd also like to encourage FCPS to work with local civic associations, homeowners associations, uh, to establish speed bumps or speed humps on streets where many children cross the street to go to school. Uh, we need those, especially given the, the lack of uh, school uh, crossing guards uh, since we're having trouble recruiting them. Um, third, I'd, I'd like to encourage FCPS to work with VDOT and the county to establish dedicated uh, bike lanes protected by physical barriers of some kind because studies show uh, those actually protect bicyclists uh, and so students and families can bike to school um, because they offer a lot more protection than just a line paint on the ground. Um, I also wanted to comment forth that um, the first instinctive response of SPS for each and every problem seems to be to hire a vendor, but we should use our talented, dedicated advisory uh, uh, committees such as FPAC, which is very underutilized. They'll do the work for free rather than having to hire a vendor who doesn't know anything about FCPS. And finally, I'd like to understand the, uh, the contracting process that was used for DLR because I've reviewed the materials and I'm, um, while I'm, I, I applaud FCPS staff, DLR has done a fairly underwhelming job and I really don't want to base any cue based on any work done by DLR because I don't see um, anything meaningful that could actually be, you know, cause or contribute to a meaningful discussion. Thank you. Okay, I will try to answer all your questions. I might ask for some clarifications um, noted on the Mount Vernon piece and your question about the traffic signage being comprehensively reviewed. Uh, we do have a safe routes to school program. We have an office of safety and security and we have an office of transportation that would all play a part in that. I do know though that will require for actual implementation um, county partnership, right? Because all public space, um, be it along the sides of roads or even outside our property on our blocks or what have you, those are all managed by either VDOT or VCDOT. So any kind of signage would be built and implemented by them. So I just wanna make sure that you're aware of that, but we are happy to take a look at, you know, where the needs arise and knowing about the transportation and safety needs across uh, the department. Um, I can speak to the contracting process. I might rely a little bit on Mr. Fanshaw uh, while he was in the role when the uh, AE was procured, but it's my understanding that here at Fairfax, every couple years, we do put out a competitive 
RFP to solicit AE vendors. Uh, so they would come, people would put in proposals, and then they would be ranked in the top 10 or so would be then selected. And so as uh, AE needs come up, we would use and go down the line uh, in respect to contract value. And so I believe that was how um, DLR was awarded the project. Okay, so <laughs> your outstanding questions, is, is there something? Oh, oh sorry, um, uh, I, I, they were more comments to encourage FCPS to work towards dedicated protected bike lanes and, and speed bumps on streets with, Duly with, noted. with children. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, next we have Mr. Frisch. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, along the lines of uh, Mr. Dunn's questioning, at the last CIP, um, the board approved unanimously a follow-on motion um, directing the development of an annually updated school traffic and pedestrian safety assessment program that would be similar to how we do the CIP, right? And so uh, obviously we can only work our side of the street, so to speak, <laughs> um, and partner with allies who are responsible for other elements of these issues which can be a headache. And that's one of the reasons why a, you know, a more systematic approach is necessary. Can you, uh, it doesn't have to be today, but could you provide a, an update in the Friday letter or the next Friday letter um, about where that, that, that work stands? Yes, sir. Um, we did take a look at that actually very recently, uh, Mr. Muick, and um, in terms of traffic patterns as well as safety. So we'll make sure we have a, an update, uh, if not this Friday, for sure next. Thank you. Because, it, you know, to Mr. Dunn's point, it's not just the signage, right? Sometimes it's the back, the traffic that gets backed up in front of a school because of kiss and ride. Um, it's all sorts of different issues that present themselves. And while I had initially uh, moved on that topic for one specific need, in talking to colleagues, Dr. Anderson and I spoke to several colleagues, and everybody had things like that all over their districts. So uh, that, that's good to hear that we're moving on that issue. Second, secondly, on the, the topic of uh, Dunloring, um, uh, I'm happy to um, share additional information and I'll email it to colleagues. Um, the initial discussion about uh, Dunloring was repurposing of the site. And in any conversation that I had with the public or with colleagues about um, the building, uh, they would always ask, how long is it going to take? How long is construction going to take? And the answer was always, we don't know until we get into the building. Um, and that doesn't begin until the work begins. And so I know that we've uh, gotten quite a bit down the road on that at this point. The area continues to grow. And new, you know, I get updates you know, every month on new developments that are being approved in the area or in the periphery. Um, and I look forward to a very uh, broad and holistic conversation around how uh, the school gets used, both from a boundary perspective, but also from a programming perspective. Those are things that get decided towards the end of this kind of timeline. Okay, Miss Lady, followed by Miss Dixon. Yes, so um, as I sat here and have listened for the little about three or three and a half hours, uh, I want to go back to a comment from Ms. Marin in her first remarks regarding the need to uh, review um, regulations or policies. Actually, we create policy um, that have not been revisited in a long time. Um, I've heard uh, several alluded to today, 8210, establish management response for capital improvements, 8230, procedures to follow for school design. I could go on and on. Um, Leasing community use, uh, 8130. Uh, I just want to put out there for that I do agree with, it, with Ms. Marin that I think that some of these are things we need to revisit because a lot of these questions um, could have be better answered um, if we review policy uh, given post COVID, given costs, given where we are right now. Um, and just it'll help uh, staff then operationalize those policies uh, and then can hopefully move us along and better answer some of the questions we've been posing all day. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Dixon. Uh, my question is regarding the Joint Environmental Task Force. Uh, there's one point here, it says commit to zero waste by 2030. I just want to know how are we doing, going, doing that and uh, do we have a plan in place? Because there's a lot of, I can see, 
uh, waste happening at the schools. Yep, and I think that's something that we can actually provide the new board. Uh, we recently provided a jet update, including zero waste, uh, in a fairly recent Friday letter, and I think it makes sense to resend that to the new board if the superintendent's in agreement. Okay, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll read that, but uh, in currently, are we doing any recycling of any, like, uh, anything in school right now in terms of um, paper waste or any other waste, plastic? Um, I think if we reduce that, recycling comes later, first is reduce, so uh, would that be included in the letter? We, we, it is included. I know uh, Mr. Muick is also here. I know with our, in particular, and uh, <laughs> Mr. McElveen's aware of this, with our lunch program, we've eliminated all the plastic flatware. We've moved to bamboo, which is recyclable and compostable. We're looking at compost uh, plans, uh, looking at trays and doing away with the styrofoam you know, looking at trays and dishwashers and that type of thing. So there's a lot of, I would say right now there's more discussion than there is action, but the flatware, like there are pragmatic steps. We are moving forward on that because to your point, that shouldn't be as costly as the carbon neutral footprint. I mean, that's simply around shifting practice, but not necessarily um, adding expenses. Although the initial investment into uh, equipment, dishwashers and that type of thing, but uh, we are looking at that, and I, I don't know where we are with recycling with the county, Mr. Muick. I don't know if you have an update on that, but this is um, definitely, I think, a, a key strategy. Uh, no, unfortunately, I don't have an update for you on the recycling right now. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, uh, so that that's encouraging to hear. Um, my other question is about the uh, some of the schools I can see are not utilized to 100%. Obviously, there are maybe less uh, students attending the schools, and they're, they're less than 100%. So my question is, there's a way we could, I guess, boundary discussions are another thing, but is there a way we can open like a finance park on one of those schools which have lesser, uh, you know, students, but have more like a space available to them? It won't cost, again, a lot. It will be more of repurpose, repurposing, but... Personal finance and budgeting is a very important tool, and that's something I guess FCPS can um, take take on. Thank you, Ms. Dixit. I know we just signed um, <clears throat> in December a memorandum of understanding with Finance Park, yeah. which is located adjacent to Frost Middle School, and it is an important program. I visited it with uh, Ms. Darnak Kovacs in our uh, last fall. Uh, I think we are looking at different program possibilities. This morning before our work session, I was visiting our Montrose uh, Middle School program, which is near Holmes Middle School on the campus of Holmes, and just discussing what are our program availabilities, where are they located in the county. Um, so there's a lot of work that sits around program options in addition to boundaries. It almost reminds me of back in the day, we used to have different colored overlays on reports. I'm dating myself, but there's sort of boundaries and then there are programs and then, right, like, and then needs. So, and then the actual innovation queue, like where in the county are those things happening? So a lot of opportunity. It's a very target rich environment. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, another thing is the innovation lab, which you have discussed. I think uh, it'll be a great um, use of, of, of any of our school facility which are not used or repurposing any other schools because we want to get that done uh, sooner than later, not push them back in the queue like all the other programs. We, I mean, we have a lot of uh, those things where we, everything is pushed back in the queue, but some things take, uh, I think, more, they're more urgency because science and technology is changing rapidly and we need to get our students ready for that and get ready for that next generation workforce. So that'll be uh, something we'd like to see. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Lady. Um, I'm just gonna speak as a former employee in regards to your question about recycling. Um, I will say that the, and especially with the get to green, uh, you know, every school has get to green specialists. Um, uh, I can tell you at Chantilly that uh, they were, uh, 
one of the school one of the school system hired get to green folks was in our building so uh, we definitely had de designated spaces for for recycling of paper of plastic uh, of cans i will say we needed to stay on top of the training of new custodial staff as there was turnover um, and then also i think we need to reiterate all the time with staff that something can't su suddenly become recycling to a trash receptacle because of what someone threw in it so there needs to be more clarity uh, i will say that the the, the effort is there we endeavor to we've been endeavoring to do it also reduction of paper i think the fact that with one to one hopefully has addressed that as well. Um, but it's something that we cannot take our eye off of. Um, but I uh, feel confident in all of our schools that, that these initiatives should be in place. Okay, seeing no further placards. <laughs> okay, Ms. Mary. Okay, so um, I wanted to state that something that I'm hearing that we're, we're continuing a practice of advocating for renovations and whoever, whichever board member is the most effective advocate gets the renovation. And that's not equitable, it's not efficient. And so part of this is part of those policies that we need to determine a system because I'm not comfortable approving renovations haphazardly because of the way an advocate um, or group of advocates makes that happen. Secondly, I, I wanted to mention traffic safety. So thank you, Mr. Dunn, for bringing that up. Um, I've compiled summaries of transit safety related advocacy that I've been involved with for constituents. And uh, one of them starts in 2012 and when a crossing guard was hit and that school system continues to advocate after in 2021, a parent, a grandparent was hit while going to school to get their student. And to date, the project is just getting into the queue for um, being addressed in Fairfax County. Um, another elementary school has almost seen the completion of a project it has advocated for since 2017. And uh, local residents advocated and got a grant for the county's use. Um, and most sadly, as recently as 2022, we've had three students in two different, related to two different schools killed while commuting from school. Now these are not school hosted grounds and properties that we are responsible for, but they are adjacent to our school communities. And I have been going around, I met with Ms. Samansky and her team, but this is not a facilities thing. In some cases, it, there was one case where it did come down in a different school about planning and where a crosswalk was planned during the design of the building. And that was rectified. And so I do think that was a lesson learned for facilities. But all of these things, th this is that one fair facts again, but also we cannot be expected to spend our time advocating for traffic solutions if our goal is to focus on excellent education. I think that is a really great item for our agenda for the Board of Supervisors too. Mr. Frisch, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, Miss, yes? Yeah, I, I do want to thank John Cunning. Yeah. Thank you. I do want to mention that although, as I was looking at the report and I was looking at schools that are 88% and it appears that they have space, again, because I've been in the schools, I know that there is no space there. And so if you really go talk to the people in the building trying to find spaces to uh, implement programming, even though on the report, it looks like, oh, there's space there. There truly isn't. And so I don't know if there's an audit mechanism where we can say, how is it really being used? Um, because I know in the building that I was recently at, there is no space, but it shows that there is. And people are struggling to find a room to go do this or go do that. And I understand that it's, you know, we're looking at capacity, but we have to look at true capacity and we have to look at how the buildings truly are being used. And people down on the ground are very flexible, but they're also very frustrated. And I just want us to be honest about what really is happening down on the ground. Okay, thank you, Ms. St. John Cunning. Uh, we have Ms. Sizemore Heiser online. Thank you, everybody. And just briefly, um, Dr. Yeah, no, I know I ended with with uh, an ask for project management plan and sort of an advocacy and communications plan. Um, you know, and in looking at the DLR report, they outline very broadly, you know, what the next steps in sort of phase two planning is. So my question is, what has been done with the recommendations of the DLR report to date, and how would that fit into the suggestions I made around the plan for the renovation queue is the first question. I have a second one, so I'll pause there. 
Thank you. I don't believe there's been anything that's been done yet with the recommendations from the DLR group. And um, so there shouldn't be any problem interfacing with your suggestion um, at this point. So I guess my question is, I know there's some staff responses to the DLR report, but um, it, what, was, what is your plan, I guess, moving forward to date? I mean, I know I've made suggestions, but what have you guys been planning to date in terms of how to make this renovation queue happen, as well as address some of these issues around the backlog of maintenance? I'll pause there. So, great question. I think we were trying to get the CIP done um, because it's coming due uh, for a variety of reasons at this time of year and then working forward on a project management plan for the three queues I mentioned. One, facilities, two, security, and three, athletics. Great. I think you need to add um, a plan for the implementation or the integration of the strategic plan into those three plans, right, and the priorities yeah. of the strategic yeah. plan. So I want to make sure that's part of that conversation, um, as well as just you know, you're looking at those, looking at access to facilities, and I think it'd be helpful as you look at those three plans to Ms. Marin and Ms. Lady's point, what policies then need to be updated? Because one thing I think I'm hearing in the last four years is that we're not always doing that crosswalk, right, between changes we make in plans or um, and the crosswalk to what policy need to be updated. Um, I know Ms. Marin, I've talked to her about briefly and affecting Mr. Frisch, and I know Ms. Marin's brought this up too about process for reviewing policies, right? We've been reviewing the thousand series, but do we have a process within your internal staff to crosswalk this to policy so we're not after the fact saying, oh, wait a second, that policy hasn't been updated and yet we're now on, I mean, that policy talks about A and we're now on X. So I'll pause there and ask that question about that crosswalk, that proactive crosswalk. And you're asking about crosswalking policies to the plan and you're saying the plan for the queues, is that correct? Well, even like the strategic plan, right? Like, we have a strategic plan in place. Have we crosswalked to any policies that need to be updated? Um, when we do a cube, it just feels like when we're doing this work, are we crosswalking back to policies to make sure our policies are reflecting the, the state of the schools, let's say? I think we could do a better job of that. I know a number of our policies are not current, so we've been often relying on a regulation, which we have a little bit more control over, uh, but we can do a better job of that. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah, I think if any of my time's up, but if it just briefly, I would recommend as you're coming up with this project management plan, that that's a piece of that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate it. Seeing no one further for this round, <coughs> uh, your next round, um, we will uh, revert back to go, 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 go backs. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, Ms. okay, Mr. Dunn. Um, I'd like to ask about bathrooms. Um, so I attended a, a safety and security forum with Dr. Reed at Sandberg Middle School, which is where my children attended. And the comment was made uh, by a parent there that at that moment, all of the boys' bathrooms in the entire school were locked because they had all been destroyed. And this is just a few weeks ago. This is not like back when the TikTok trend was happening. So I'd like to understand where the money comes for that um, and then understand maybe some security practices that are being put in place with bathrooms because I know that's been a discussion of the prior board. Um, second, um, I wanted to encourage, given that uh, Ms. Zemanski are new, we have some amazing volunteers like Kathy Hosick in the audience who has gone to, who's a member of FPAC, and goes to different meetings and, and has found, to reinforce Ms. St. John Cunning's point, that the people who are in the buildings uh, aren't uh, communicating with the people who are planning the buildings. I think it's really the people playing the buildings who should be doing, have the burden of the communication. And so you have renovations being planned that don't make any sense, right? And so questioning the queue, I think, is very vital, but also having that communication, because Gatehouse is not so large that people shouldn't be talking to each other across offices. And finally, I just wanted to emphasize on FPAC and elsewhere, we have people who you can consult with in-house for free about solar. And as, as someone who's been in the utility industry for a long time, I can tell you that those interconnection fees are high because Dominion doesn't want interconnections. It doesn't want more solar. That's how it's regulated on a state level. Um, and the fact it's kind of an abusive monopoly. So um, I would encourage you to not just look at solar 
you know, solar for roofs, because that's going to be hard given Virginia's utility environment, but also geothermal and other renewable energy options, including purchasing electricity from renewable energy sources. Mr. Dunn, I'd like to respond to the Sandburg Middle School concern around bathrooms. Uh, you're correct. We did hold a meeting that evening. The next morning, uh, Dr. Ponce, myself, and Mr. Lynette, the regional assistant superintendent for Sandburg, visited the school to meet with the administrative team. I walked the entire campus uh, inside and out with the principal, Mr. Underhill. Um, there was a bathroom that had yellow tape across because facilities uh, needed to be repaired. I did connect with Ms. Siminski that morning, and I believe it was the repairs were completed by the end of the day. Uh, it is not true that bathroom, all the boys' bathrooms were um, inaccessible at any time, uh, but we did resolve the bathroom very near the front door that had some equipment uh, concerns based on vandalism. So we are definitely committed to that, and we do have funds that are set aside to do repairs of routine maintenance in the schools. Um, I would just uh, uh, pick up uh, me speaking personally for myself on um, the bathroom renovation um, issue. So about um, 12 years ago, we, um, we were having a major bathroom issue in the county, uh, particularly among the legacy schools, including Falls Church, uh, who were the last, and Oakton, who were the last to be renovated in that, that queue. Um, and we set aside around $5 million, I think, at the time to, to renovate those bathrooms. And I, I would be interested um, to have some sort of sense of how our bathrooms are doing countywide for those, for those schools that um, have not been recently renovated uh, and see if we need to um, do like we did before and allocate funding uh, for, for those renovations. Um, because, yeah, I, you know, I think as we saw at McLean High School, uh, they badly needed bathroom renovations and we were able to make that happen. So kudos to staff and everyone who's doing that work right now. But they aren't the only school that needs that. Um, and that brings up another point, maybe, maybe two or three other points. But um, the first that I want to raise is on um, uh, access to menstrual hygiene products. So that's been something that we've worked on for many years. It's now state law um, to have dispensers uh, uh, in at least the female restrooms. Um, but what I'm hearing from students is that products are not there. We have the dispensers, but not the products. Um, so I'd be curious to know if we have central funding set aside for that or if school, schools individually are supposed to fund those products. Um, and if so, it's an equity issue because um, not everyone is having access to those products when it's not only our policy, but it's now state law. Um, and also, I would be curious, we were at a forum last night at Justice High School, four of us, along with Dr. Reed and others, um, and we heard about um, cameras being placed at bathrooms. Now, I was not sure if they were talking about inside or outside the bathroom. Okay. Well, that was not clear from the conversation. But um, when it comes to security issues, I'd be grateful. I know the, uh, the prior board has done a lot on the pilots for, um, for vape sensors and things like that. Um, I think we, we really could have a, a whole work session devoted to bathrooms. So um, I'd be eager to hear updates on, on those efforts. Yeah. Um, Dr. Anderson, or did, did you, uh, Dr. Reed, do you want to respond? Sure, sure, okay. yeah. yeah. So updates on restroom facilities. And we just, I think um, we are working on renovating as reasonable. The menstrual product availability, um, I think, is more likely than not maintaining a supply because probably as soon as they're put out because they need to be freely accessible, they disappear very likely. So, I mean, they're used quickly. So I think likely we're trying to determine what type of uh, secure, accessible way we can provide these products. Because I think there's, it's clear the division has an intent to make sure those are provided and that um, they're also, that we can keep up with the supply and demand. So I, um, we will do a tally to see where we have challenges on that topic, uh, but there's a commitment to making sure we have that, and it should be division. I mean, we can order at a scale very differently than a school, so it would seem like that's a division-funded um, initiative. And I'll leave it at that at this point. I, the rest of the bathroom topics, I, 
I think sometimes we also have to, I would just encourage our community to check in with principals or teachers when they hear things about bathrooms being closed. We recently had an elementary school where I was uh, pinged also about uh, no soap in restrooms. And as it turns out, that's not true. We did have one soap dispenser that was vandalized and we're waiting on a work order um, from October, which I'll meet with staff about to get that replaced. But I think sometimes we hear a, a piece of information or a data point, and then it becomes a bit of a suburban legend. Uh, and it, we sort of, in the absence of probably if, um, communication that could be clear if we knew that was a, a topic, uh, it takes on a life of its own. So we want to make sure we have some balance. Also, to your point around the vaping sensors, we are looking at ways in which to keep our bathrooms uh, safer. Um, but uh, to put a fine point on cameras, they are, we never will have cameras in a bathroom. The cameras would be outside in the hall to be able to assist staff in determining who went in or out of a restroom at a given time. So I just want to clarify that. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. I remember what I wanted to say and so much more. My initial question was about boundary. I know you've heard it come up in this discussion. We have talked about it in my one-on-one -on -one with you multiple times. Where are we in terms of having a planned discussion on that? Um, I would defer to our chair, Mr. Okay. Frisch. I'm all ears. Uh, we recently received a forum topic uh, requesting the board to consider um, a holistic review and update to the boundary policy. Um, I think I got it last week, and we're going to be talking about scheduling it uh, in chairs this week, so stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Um, secondly, we've talked about a lot of queues. Obviously, we have the renovation queue, and conversations <laughs> that we've had, we've talked about maybe a school fencing queue. Um, we talked about the school traffic queue. We've talked about turf fields queue, athletic fields queue. How do we put all these things in one easier package to manage, kind of akin to what Ms. Eismore-Heiser said with the, with the project management, but how do we keep track of all of these different things that are generally related, but they're different? Some of them we could achieve with one-time monies, because what I want to have these cues be teed up for is when we have mid-year funding, end-of-the-year funding, that we automatically slide them into the conversation and into the funding. So... The fencing queue would be in the security queue because fencing, cameras, door locks, uh, vestibules are all connected in terms of safety and security. The turf fields would be in the athletic facility queue because they're part of um, athletic facilities. And I agree, each of those queues are critical to manage and maintain. I would also argue that several of these queues are department unique. Uh, the safety and security queue would fall within Office of Safety and Security. Athletics would fall into a, our athletics office as well as um, facilities um, and planning. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's senior leadership that's going to have to manage a queue dashboard, for lack of a better term. Uh, but you're right. Absent queues, all we have is sort of the loudest voice or who happens to be the last person heard. And I don't think that's going to be, you know, in keeping with our strategic plan that reinforces equity, access, and opportunity. Thank you for that. But more importantly, I appreciate what you've just said, but the criteria to establish all of these cues, that has to be what is articulated to not just us, but also to the public. Because it cannot come across as if whomever's the loudest is who gets your ear. Yes, ma'am. That goes back to what I, can, what I call business rules, or you can call them working assumptions. Uh, in prior divisions where I've worked for any number of projects, we had to clarify those assumptions. And frankly, honestly, that's an elected board of director, in my opinion. Uh, that's your setting sort of those. We talked about um, swim lanes with our last uh, board, but what are those uh, working rules that we have to consider when we're putting a queue together, and I think the board has a vested interest in that, then I can pivot to staff once we've agreed on those business rules, and I'm happy to bring a draft for a forum topic or a work session. But once we have those business rules set, then I can work with staff on making sure that we apply those um, rigorously uh, to make sure that our queue meets the expectations for the board who are elected to represent our community. 
Well, I don't, I want to lend my voice to this, Mr. Frisch. I would love to have a work session on the criteria that's going to be established to um, satisfy each of these cues. I, I don't want it to be a forum topic from one of us if it doesn't have to be a forum topic from one of us. It's already ongoing work. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to raise, bathrooms, I've seen some that have doors, some that don't have doors, that kind of have that front little section. What is the criteria? What's the ed spec regarding doors on restrooms? I'll have to defer to staff on uh, ed spec criteria. I do believe you might be seeing some differences because, again, oftentimes we're working with existing conditions. You don't want to have no doors uh, where there's sight lines, right? So it would make sense to have doors. In other instances where the sight line isn't there, you could have the doors taken off and it could still function. So I will say, I think existing conditions are probably what's driving the differences. And then I can have staff chime in, you know, where it's a more even playing field, say at new construction or what, what our ed specs were like. And I wasn't advocating for one or the other. I just yeah. know also it's a difference that I do see, but I also know it matters to our school staff from a security perspective. There are different things that either option provides a benefit so for. dr anderson can i pause just for a moment i i want to be clear that the community listening understands when we're talking about doors or no doors we're talking about the entrance to the restroom yes. we're not talking about being able to utilize the restroom privately no. okay i just wanted to clarify that yes, because the bathroom. okay i just want to make sure our community understands that no thank you for that clarification um and lastly i do want to echo what mr um McElveen shared, I, I have heard from the students at Justice High School, particularly not having the sanitary products available to them on a regular basis. And, and digging into that a little bit, um, what I was told is it needs to be ordered by the school, and the school was in delay of ordering, and I was never able to get an answer as to who is the responsible person, because the school then says it comes from, you know, this warehouse. Either way, there's no products. Uh, I will look into that and make sure we remedy that. And I also just, last thing, to make sure that they're available at our elementary schools, because I don't think we have that um, equity of access there, and we do have students who do require it. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Moon? Just a couple of quick questions regarding a capital project funding sources on page number five of the PowerPoint presentation. Capital sinking fund, about $9 million for FY22 and 23. Is that two years combined was $9 million or just each year was about $9 million? Yeah, again, this is the carryover funds from the county, so we don't have an accurate prediction, but we're anticipating based upon what we got last year to be about $9 million. No, I'm only asking what's on the, on the slide number five. It is $9 million in FY22. That's in the past. FY23, that's in the past. Whether there was $9 million each year or both combined? It's each year. Each year. Mm -hmm. And there is no guarantee that this will continue. Is that? Correct. OK. And for the proffers allocated to capital projects for FI23 was 4.4. Do they generally come in with the conditions to be used for particular projects within a particular school, or do they come in to be used for any capital projects for a particular school or a particular area? Yeah, I'm going to have Brian answer that one. Yep, uh, proffer funds have to be used specifically for schools and capacity. Uh, to build capacity in those schools to offset the development. There's often some other stipulations with them, um, but generally it has to be specifically for a school to build capacity. So if the school is already slated to get a certain amount of funding, this additional funding does not increase amount of funding, but basically displace the existing funding so if a school already allocated? If a school that's under construction receives proffer money, then that bond money that was allocated to the project goes back into either the construction reserve or to the next project. It's not that the school will get additional. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Uh, Dixit, then Ms. St. John, oh wait, 
you don't need it. Okay, Ms. Dixon. Hi. Uh, my question was on the queue. A lot of people discussed this queue question. I see then currently uh, the queue, it would start in 2009. We are in 2024, and those renovations have not gone through. So we can uh, see those, uh, how li long did these schools have been waiting to get renovated. So any changes on their renovation would be detrimental because they they were listed to be renovated for a reason and uh, identified by the school. Um, the current queue, which I guess is now from from now, which new queue we're talking about, with new schools developing, that is something can be tweaked based on, I guess, boundary discussions and other thing. But um, uh, for for personally, even seeing how late, how long the schools have been waiting, um, there should not be any changes, uh, in my opinion. And um, uh, and I'm seeing that there are schools, high schools particularly, are um, on the western side of Fairfax are over capacity. Um, that's where we have to put our uh, brain together and find some creative ways to, um, you know, the the western high school. Uh, we, we we know that the the chart says it's a land acquisition by 2030. That's too late. Um, that's like six years and now, and the renovation and I mean the construction could start another 10 years and um, whatnot. So we have to see the urgency of situation. Um, high schools, the students, um, it's a very important time for them as they're getting ready to go to their you know next phase of life and career and. Uh, I think overcrowding can lead to a lot of issues, as all of, all of us know, and management is poor if there are too many kids in the building and lack, you know, less staff to handle them. So I think we need to focus on these high schools, even in the new queue as well. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for this round. Um, so if not, we're gonna start the next round. Uh, Dr. Anderson and Mr. Dunn. Dr. Anderson, go ahead. Two minutes each. Oh, you don't need it, okay. Then we're down to one. You're, are you done? Okay, well, seeing, seeing no further um, placards, uh, we will adjourn. Uh, but first, let me say that, uh, remind everyone that next steps uh, can be submitted at the link online that was provided by our, our um, fantastic clerk uh, earlier today. Um, and I will turn it over to, do you want, have any closing remarks? Uh, turn it over to our chair just to, if, if he has any final remarks in advance of our upcoming meetings. Thank you, everyone. We did it. We got out 50 minutes early. Cheers.